We'll call this meeting of the Silver City Town Council to order. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I could ask Councilor Moronis to read our mission statement, please. Thank you, Mayor. Silver City is the hub of an inclusive community settled within a small town that through guided growth honors and preserves its historical, cultural, and natural her heritage while facilitating jobs, health, and education resources such that the residents and visitors may enjoy and protect the recreational opportunities of the area and high quality of life. The next item on the agenda with action is public input. I remind you you have five minutes to speak, and I will try to give you a one-minute warning if you're looking at me. And the first person up is Lori Ford to discuss CATS TV. Mayor, Council, staff, good evening. My name is Lori Ford. I'm the Executive Director of Community Access Television and also of KOOT 88.1 FM. And I just wanted to let everybody know, including the public, because I know there's a lot of fans of Channel 19, that we apologize for the audio being so bad on the rebroadcast of the meetings for so long, but we have finally got a new audio board in. We worked with the county on getting that. The county owned the old audio board and so, therefore, we worked with them on having them purchase us a new one. So, out there in the public, if anybody hears any horrible, horrible audio on the rebroadcast, I don't believe that it would be equipment error, possibly human error. And feel free to call me at 534-0130 and let me know. And we have some exciting news about KOOT 88.1 FM. That is your community, your station. Um, it is what community radio sounds like. We're getting all kinds of new members signing up. We have some new shows that are airing on Sundays. It's really exciting. Um, we are broadcast from midnight to noon, seven days a week. Uh, I've been talking with Radio Bilingue, who we share that time slot with, and um, I'm predicting soon that we will be negotiating for the rest of the 12 hours, so we're really super excited about that. I also wanted to let everybody know that the community calendars, we now have them in blocks. So people can tune in at the same time every single day and see what the community needs and, you know, what the governmental bodies need as far as um, volunteers for committees and that sort of thing. On Channel 17, they air at 10 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. And on Channel 18, the community calendar block airs at 6 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. I just felt it was really important instead of having them kind of spread out through the whole 24 hours that we put them in blocks so people will know, you know, when they can sit down if they're having dinner or coffee in the morning and watch the community calendar and go, oh, you know what, I could volunteer for that committee that the mayor needs members on or, or, or whatever. We have um, Tour of the Gila on there and everything that they need. There's just a lot of stuff on the community calendar. And it is always current and updated on a daily basis. On Channel 19, I've kind of took the liberty, I have taken the liberty, of putting any of the governmental PSAs on Channel 19. I've, I have been getting some feedback from viewers of Channel 19 saying it's, hard because one meeting just goes into the next, boom, 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 boom. And so in order to break up those meetings a little bit, we have PSAs that the different government entities in town need. 
So we're very proud of KOOT 88.1 FM, and we came up with the slogan, Your Community, Your Station, because we feel that it fits. KOOT 88.1 FM has been broadcasting on the air since 2009, and I just want to invite anybody out there, if they do want to learn how to be on the radio, they can come up and check us out at 213 North Bullard, and I have bumper stickers for you. Thanks, Lord. Could you guys hear on the microphone when Lori was talking? Okay. Another issue. Cats is only responsible for the audio of the broadcast. We are not responsible for the audio in the room. And make sure it's on. And we are working with the county on that. <laughs> I think they heard me on the broadcast mic with the new audio board. And um, another exciting event for CATS is we will be taping the uh, Silver City School Board meetings soon. I am working on that with uh, the president of the school board, Trent Petty. Thank you. Irene Mossberg. You want to wave? So we'll go to Jason Amaro. Can I speak after input with the campus officers? No, we, we need to do it. In okay. Sounds good. Uh, Mayor, council members, just a quick uh, little uh, heads up. I've been working with the Game of Fish on this deer issue in uh, Indian Hills for probably about three years. Uh, it's a really serious problem. I live in Indian Hills, and there's deer all over the place. Um, as a sportsman and advocate for the outdoors, I really hope that uh, as a hunter that we can be part of the solution to the deer problems we're having in the area. Uh, I understand that they're going to present a few proposals uh, that may include some trapping, some, uh, some uh, archery hunts in the area and that type of thing. So absolutely, these guys have been working really hard on this, and uh, I fully support them. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm the board of directors of the Mexico Wildlife Federation for New Mexico. It's an elected position. I'm kind of the, you know, the southwestern region representative, and uh, we've all come to agreement this is something we really believe in. So um, please listen to what these guys have got to say. Uh, they've done a ton of work. Uh, we have a serious deer problem there in the Indian Hills area. Uh, we have to put a lot of work in and uh, absolutely support them. So thank you guys very much. Next on the agenda is council comments. Councilor Bettison, would you like to start? Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, mention that last week I attended the um, special tax task force of the New Mexico Municipal League um, that I've been placed on by uh, the league's uh, board president. And um, I was uh, representing Silver City along with uh, many other folks that were from the towns of uh, Gallup, Las Cruces, Albuquerque, Roswell, Rio Rancho. Um, there are also some small communities that were there, including Tejeras and Taos Ski Valley. It was more of a, about a three, three and a half hour meeting for us to kind of come together to talk about what we're trying to do and trying to separate municipal taxes from um, state taxes and the collection and actually management of those taxes um, because of the um, threats to um, particularly gross receipts taxes um, through a variety of actually a number of years of legislative sessions the mayor talked about several weeks ago and that I've mentioned as well um, that has happened over the past several legislative sessions. 
it's something that uh, we're concerned about since the majority, 70 percent of our of most budgets of most municipalities come from gross receipts taxes. So uh, we need to make sure that we watch where, you know, that we know where those monies are coming from and that, that those monies are not uh, in any way, shape, or form um, taken away from us by the, by the state. Um, so we're working together. There will be a number of meetings to try to figure out how best to approach the subject. Um, to work with the legislature, Representative um, is it Tom Taylor from Jenny, uh, from uh, Farmington was there. He's a former municipal league president and a former mayor of Gallup, and if I'm correct, Gallup or Farmington? Farmington, Farmington my apologies, um, Representative Taylor. So he was with us for about an hour and a half um, and had some very good input as a former mayor and as a current uh, legislator. So we will be working together, and I'll give you updates along the way um, as to how we progress. I also wanted to mention that uh, after our last conversation about pole placement by PNM, I, I find it now um, that uh, I keep finding poles in very unusual places. I mentioned to, to uh, Mr. Brown today and also to the mayor that uh, I saw one being placed to, on Highway 180 uh, on Silver Heights Boulevard right in the middle of a sidewalk almost. So it's sort of one of the things that I know that uh, Mr. Pena or has already um, been discussing that with the State um, Highway Department so that they can then discuss it with p &M about the placement of their poles. And there's also been a few other things that I've noticed too. So we'll be discussing that with them as well. But interesting given the topic that was just raised um, two weeks ago with uh, one of our ordinances on the franchise. The last thing I just wanted to say is um, I know that we have a municipal election coming up. I encourage everyone to exercise their right to vote. It's not a privilege, it's a right. So please get out and vote. Um, I've enjoyed working with the council. I know that definitely we're not going to see Councilor Thompson again and I want to really um, thank him for being part of the council and I want to say how much I appreciate having him sit next to me and and uh, have our discussions that we've had over the past couple of years and um, I wish um, good luck and good fortune to everyone that's running and we'll see how it comes out in a couple of weeks but please do vote thank you Mayor. thank you I'm confident we will see Councillor Thompson again but He's like 10 feet tall and dressed like a yellow chicken. Well, so. it's true, but not necessarily here as a yellow chicken, right? You never Hopefully know. Not. Well, that could be, okay. I meant right sitting here. Maybe not. Oh, no, not here. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Thompson, you have the floor. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, my last uh, day um, on the council, and uh, I'd just like to, to, to thank the council. Um, the mayor uh, had – was – very welcoming when I first uh, came on the council, and um, we had some great conversations. Uh, something that really stuck with me was uh, when he was explaining his time as a, um, uh, an emergency um, worker, <laughs> uh, paramedic, how he would set, uh, he would go and he'd have a call, and uh, once the patient was stabilized, and they were moving him out, he would go and, and look in the refrigerator. And, of course, I thought he was looking for leftovers because that's how I see the world. But um, <laughs> actually what he was looking at is, is what sorts of medications mm -hmm. the patients were taking. I guess looking in the refrigerator gives you a lot of information about the patient to most efficiently uh, help him um, once he hits the emergency room or her. Um, and that became uh, quite an important metaphor for me for how we attack any sort of problem. You know, where is the refrigerator and uh, uh, how, do we, how do we look at it and how do we communicate that later on? And um, that's something that will stay with me uh, for the rest of my life, I'm sure. Um, Councillor um, Ray uh, con has confirmed my suspicions that bikers are kind people. <laughs> you know, when he, uh, he was a, he's a newest guy on the council, and he would come and help me out. You know, and and uh, I think that's what uh, 
bikers do. I mean, whenever I've been broken down, which, you know, I always had cheap automobiles and my bicycle often breaks down, it's always the bikers that stop and help out. And so I kind of had those suspicions, and he totally confirmed those. And he's always offered to take me up to Boston Hill and other places that uh, he frequented as a child. And then uh, Councillor Morona, same thing, just a pleasure to talk to. Um, having two guys on the council that uh, grew up here and were such wild guys when they were growing up, I think, is a really good thing. Because we... Just have to add them that way. We have a problem, and our kids are in that our, our kids aren't active enough. And these were were active young men. They were they have memories of playing in uh, Pinos Altos drainage and up in Boston Hill before it was public property. And um, I, I think that is some that that perspective is is critical in uh, in a leadership capacity. And and finally, um, Council Councilor Bettison, uh, truly respect your work ethic. Um, uh, no one works harder than you do on this okay. stuff. And um, Ann Mackey, this last six months have been pretty hard on me. Um, always I'd go in, and it's just so pleasant talking with you, always. And I'd have to say that for the whole town hall. Um, everyone there is so pleasant. Um, and they all work really hard. Uh, Alex, um, every time I've needed to talk to you, your door's been open, and you, I think, remember what it's like to struggle as a young family, and my, one of my concerns is that our young families have, have it kind of hard right now, and having a town manager that understands those struggles um, is, is critical. Um, the rest of the departments, uh, just really impressed. Uh, Peter Pena, um, He's the department head that I've dealt with most. Been, uh, he's been spectacular. Everything I've ever um, talked to him about, he's been reasonable. Well, he's been great in dealing with him um, and always available. And I guess the last thing is uh, the animal ordinance. I, there, I guess folks need an explanation of what's gone on with that. Um, spent about a year on that. Um, the overarching goal was to reduce uh, nuisance problems and expenditures by 50% in a five-year, six-year period. Um, and to do that, we used uh, we we proposed um, using market mechanisms and some other things, community policing, primarily. Um, we had a, a work session, and in that work session. Um, did the numbers and we just staff and, and council really wasn't too enthusiastic about it. And the problem with uh, the ordinance is that the ordinance was probably 30 or 40 percent of all the things that would have to happen in order to get the sorts of reductions that we wanted to see. And if we couldn't get staff and council on board, I mean, I would I would have pushed it. Even not being on council, I would have done the work. Um, but we just didn't have the numbers. Um, so I dropped it. Um, that's it. It's been good. Councilor Ray. Thank you for your comments. And it was very enjoyable being here with you the short time that I've been here. And uh, good luck in your endeavor. And also, be sure and vote. Councilor Moniz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to reiterate, it's been a, it's been an honor working with uh, Councilor Thompson. We we came onto the council together and uh, had to learn a, a, a lot at the at the same time. And, and it's uh, it's always been refreshing getting uh, your perspective on on things. Uh, very profound um, questions and comments, and, and I, I think they they help lead us in in the, the right direction on on just about everything that we've we've done here over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I wanted to tell everybody that, as I mentioned in our last meeting, we had intervened in the P&M filing to close their payment centers, and we were actually the only municipality in the state that intervened, and there was three other parties. And 
we should be getting a, the latest settlement offer in the next few days, but the, the brief of it is that the payment center will close on the 15th, and they had previously reported that they would be <clears throat> excuse me, charging a $1 fee if you were to pay by check or go to one of the Western Union places and, and pay your electric bill. The current offering is that they will waive all the fees, so p and is going to pick up its $2.35.45 through the next rate increase, at which time their operational expenses and can be dealt with through the, the rate process. They're suspecting that that next rate increase would be ending in December of 2013. The other is watch for coming in April. They will be down here doing an informational fair and making sure that everybody knows how to make their, their electric payments as well as what other programs that they offer to, to help you with decreasing your electric bill through efficiency measures. And there's some other LIHEAP and low-income programs that are out there, and they'll have information there for those. So the good news is for the, probably the next year, a little over a year, you're not going to have to pay the dollar fee if you want to pay in cash or check. The bad news is they're going to be applying for a rate increase coming next year or the end of this year. So the next issue is the we've spent probably a good two weeks now working diligently on the Grand County Water Commission's proposal for a regional water system. We've gone through the Tier 2 review and we've seen our scores. The state was pretty much forced to expose everybody's proposals and scoring to give us a better review. We've had several meetings with Interstate Stream to discuss and try to negotiate some issues on that. There is a Interstate Stream Commission meeting tomorrow in Albuquerque where the Tier 2 scores and recommendations from Interstate Stream will be presented and voted on by the Commission. And I really want to tell Peter Russell thank you. He really goes above and beyond. He's driven to Santa Fe. He'll be in Albuquerque tomorrow. He's here tonight. And he knows these issues. He understands the, the engineering and the extremely technical issues that, that we have to deal with on, on this topic. And he represents you very, very well. I don't think we could find a better person to represent us. And I think it's very important that, that the public know that. And I also think it's important he takes a lot of heat because he asks a lot of tough questions. And those questions are always appropriate. And he works with, with me and the, the rest of the staff very well in making sure that we have our, our ducks in a row and that our arguments are, are solid. And so thank you, Peter. And with that, we will move on. Anybody need room two? Any changes to the agenda? Hearing none. Approval of minutes of the regular meeting of the town council, February 13th, 2012. Mr. Mayor. Councilor. I move that we approve the minutes of the regular council meeting of February 13th, 2012. Is there a second? I'll second it. As read. There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Town Council of February 13, 2012. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second. No discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is under reports. And first report we have is deer management for the Silver City area by the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Councilors, Mayor, can everyone hear me? Is that where we're good? 
I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ray Altonen. I'm the chief of the Southwest area with the New Mexico Game and Fish out of Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, I'm coming here before you tonight mainly because we have been approached by numerous folks in the community to address some of the deer issues that are occurring around Silver City and the county. Um, our staff first came to the city council back in April 28th, I believe it was, um, 2010, to visit with the council. Um, not sure if any of you were here at this time, so I would like to represent what was given to you folks and then also to our game commission council, uh, game commission last August. I was here about two weeks ago to talk to the Grant County Council also, and we had visited with them two years before as we've come up with this plan on ways to address some of the concerns that are being put out there for deer management in the Silver City area. We've come up with a three-pronged approach that was approved by our game commission to address some of the issues, and I'll get that in here in the PowerPoint. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask And as we go forward with this. Our goals of objective, one is to reduce the deer population. We'll never get rid of every deer in Silver City or a surrounding area. That is not feasible or anything that we have as a goal. We want to reduce some of the population so we minimize human safety concerns. That's vehicle accidents, aggressive deer, that nature. Reduce deer complaints to our citizens, people that are wanting to grow a garden, have rose bushes in their yard, those type complaints. Minimize vehicle collisions. Minimize disease concerns. When you have a high population in a concentrated area, diseases are passed amongst the animals much quicker, so it can lead to bigger things. So we want to be aware of that. We want to educate residents on the negative impacts of feeding wildlife and reduce the number of residents feeding the deer. These are some of our goals and objectives with this program that we're putting forward. In the wild, you have what we call biology. You have a natural setting. That's where you have a sustainable population within a habitat carrying capacity. That's how many deer that habitat can carry. Uh, we utilize hunting to help mandate that carrying capacity as for recreation. And then also you have a natural predator-prey relationship. That's where you have the normal activity of predators preying on the prey for food and living. These are natural. This is what we like to see. This is what we strive for out in normal settings. In an artificial setting, kind of like the Silver City area, and you may not be able to see closer till I give you the next picture here, but you have feeding. This increases the body condition of the animal. That means they can reproduce better. There's not as many uh, predators or problems going on with that population. They're protected, except for stray dogs chasing them around the neighborhoods. They become very acclimated to the neighborhoods and create problems in that sense. You have habitat degradation. As you increase your population, they're going to keep eating plants around them. That's the rose bushes. That's the gardens. That's the trees, as I'll show you here in a bit. Uh, as the populations increase in this as they acclimate in the urban settings. Then you also have disease concerns. When you do have a lot of animals in one area, you have that nose-to-nose -nose contact that can spread diseases. As we look at this next picture, that fawn was laying inside the dog pen. That means this is not a good thing when you have reproduction occurring in dog pens in somebody's yards. It's something that does occur, and it'll occur statewide and everything, but it's not something that we want to promote or have in a natural setting uh, in any way, shape, or form. You see a likelihood of twins because of their body condition. They're in better shape than what's in the surrounding country. As you notice this year, we had a severe drought. We had very little reproduction success with our deer out in the wilderness. Very, very little. We are down into single digits on our survey. In Silver City, we're getting twins, uh, which increases to a population which impacts everything around them. You don't have large groups inside of yards uh, as they acclimate to the urban area. And then you have private property damage to gardens, livestock feed, trees, fences. If you look at the trees, that's all a browse line from deer. That's not growth of the tree, but that's where the deer are getting up on their legs and hitting them. And even in the surrounding area on the forest, they're having to work to get to the feet. They are over-browsing some of these areas, which move them into the town even more. This is a sign of browsing all the way up on their hind legs. So you got some pruning going on there in someone's yard. They were not too happy with this pruning situation. You can do things. Fencing. 
this is one of those things that this landowner took on their own to protect their garden. One of the things that we use in larger studying is eight-foot fence. We cannot fence every person in Silver City, nor do we want to fence the city in any way, shape, or form to create or stop this type issue. It's just not something that is feasible in any way, shape, or form. So you have people taking pressure off of their gardens. That fence may work, but that's easily jumped by a deer, I guarantee you. You have people utilizing electric fence. This is some of the fence we put up just to protect their cactus in their yard. Something that they're proud of as they maintain a manicured lawn and everything. Fencing, electric fencing is something that we do utilize. Uh, this is some of the things we help to try and resolve some of these complaints. It's not 100% effective. But it is stuff that we do try to help. We do get aggressive behavior. As the deers enter into their breeding season, we're just coming out of the breeding season now, and the bucks are, have another issue on their mind, they will stand their ground, they will attack pets, and they do scare some people in their yards, believe it or not, uh, as they stand their ground. So these are some of the complaints that we've had. Vehicle collisions is a very big issue in Silver City and the surrounding area. Uh, we have road kills, the problem of removal of the carcass. I have two officers that live here. One's not, he's supposed to be a little bit further up towards Glenwood, and then one sergeant. We cannot get to all the carcasses to remove them. It's not one of our primary jobs, just as it's not the city police department job or the sheriff's department job or anything of that nature. Uh, it's just a continual battle as we deal with deer and yards that have been hit by vehicles. And then you have the human safety. We're fortunate that we don't have any bad accidents because of speed limits and stuff, but it's always possible that there will be injuries. There's definitely a lot high property damage to vehicle collisions on the vehicle and stuff. So We have the issues of when they do die and when we get to them, just the smell in the yards. People cannot get to them, and this is a normal... <laughs> A situation that we come across when we can get to them type deal. And that's just one of those situations that's not pleasant in the neighborhoods. We have situations of this where they are hung up in fences and stuff and animals are easily being put down. It's not just that fence, it's other types of fencing as they go from neighborhood to neighborhood. And we also have to be concerned about increased predator presence, a human safety situation. As you have a high concentration of animals, you're going to draw what feeds on them, that natural predator. Um, this is the actual one, lion that was over in the members a couple years back with that attack, but we also have pet safety. And then just that predator-prey relationship close to humans, we're not necessarily the biggest fan of that because of the potential that arises there. So those are some of the things that I wanted to make you aware of and some of the problems with an increased deer population in urban areas. Control methods. This is what we came up with and presented to our commission. This particular portion of the control methods will not occur within the city limits because of your rules on discharging firearms and weapons and just the density of people. One, that we will be putting forward outside in the county. All this will occur on private property with permission and actually requested by the landowner. We just cannot go on the properties as you all cannot go on the properties and take an action. This will be working with the landowners with the homeowners on their property. Uh, we have several different things we'll do. One, we have the department kill, mit, kill permit. This is where our officers will go in and harvest some deer. The deer that we'll be concentrating on will be the does. It'll be the female breeding segment of the population. Those animals will be put to use. We have contacted Human Services Division to get a list from them of people that were interested in purchasing the deer. We'll be selling them very cheap, $4. Uh, that way the people that need them will be able to utilize them. Uh, we also are in contact with the pantry here in Silver City and doing the same thing with them. So any animal that we do harvest, we will put to use by the locals that are needing them. Okay? We're going to recommend to our commission this summer, and again as a recommendation, it may not go for it, it's just our thought as, uh, as we present it to them, as you have ordinances presented to you and say we like this or do not like this, so it may change a little bit as we go through the public process on, on recommending a hunt structure. We want to take our, unit, our archery hunts from unit 23 and 24, which is our surrounding area here on our game management units. The archery hunters that do not harvest a buck, because our bag limit for our regular hunting seasons is a buck only. They have two seasons that they can hunt around here, September, all of September, and then January 1 through January 15. If they are un unsuccessful and have not harvested a deer, 
we want to roll over into a special doe season in a special management union, which is basically the National Forest boundary south towards 180, down towards Tyrone, about 40 square miles in through there, outside of the city limits. Again, this will not occur in city limits, as it does not occur now in the city limits because of the rules. We want to make it to where they can harvest a doe and possibly use crossbows. They, again, would have to have permission from the landowners to be able to go hunting on their property. This is something that will work. That's why we want to keep it with local hunters who know some of these landowners that have enough property that they can go hunt on and keep some of this pressure on the doe segment of the population, which is your breeding segment of the population. We want to add crossbows in there just as another initiative to try and get people to try things and more enthused about doe hunting and stuff of that nature. Okay, so again, we'll focus on the harvest on the female segment, but again, this will not occur within the town limits of Silver City. Okay. What may occur, and we're not looking necessarily this year in, in Silver City, but as we go forward and we refine our methods, would be to trap and transplant. This is allowed under 17-1-14 in our department policies, RM-103. This is to address the populations that we are not able to put pressure on through hunting. We want to focus on residential areas and we'll be using the drop net. We are testing one drop net now. We have not dropped it. We're baiting as we speak. We're just here presenting. But as soon as we get clearance through our administration and there's no major concerns, we, want, we have a 20 by 20 net that is suspended in the box. It shoots off with a 308 and covers the deer. We go in remove them from the net and then throw them in the horse trailer and take them to the release sites. Okay. This will be a hard release. A hard release is where they are just immediately released into the wild. I do have to caution the council and the public. We're almost victims of our own success. Uh, there is a big push for trapping transplants. Success on some of these with hard releases is low. We are releasing them into an area where we're not getting reproduction, where the deer are having a hard time because of this drought. Food production is low. Our survival, we expect to get some survival as we're releasing them to areas that we've done some habitat work. We've had fires and the reclamation that goes on there, so it's some of our better habitat where we feel that they will have a chance. But we just want to caution that that is not a cure-all uh, in that sense and that there's an Eden out there where deer go and live happily ever after. They will still have to fight for survival. And I just want to make that clear as we go forward because it's a very uh, intensive uh, manpower effort to go with the trap and transplant. We are willing to do that, and we will continue to do that as a balanced approach with this. And that will be mainly utilized in the Silver City area uh, when we start working from the outside into some of these areas. We'll need some sheltered areas and protected areas because people like to mess with our nets, and they're about $8,000 and stuff, so we can't have vandalism or anything of that net nature, but we are interested in doing that and working with the city and areas where we have concentration of deer as we go forward and through there. Okay. Again, we've released four, or we've identified four sites or five sites around the area. Uh, the Hart Bar, Polona Mountain, Snow Lake, uh, the Alma area, and Slaughter Mesa are our primary release areas. We've worked with the Forest Service and BLM uh, to get permission from them to release there. And those are some of our better areas that we would like to release in. We'll be marking every deer that we capture with ear tags so we know if we get a report somewhere, if they made it back, we want to go quite a ways away so they just do not walk right back into the community. And we also will do some monitoring with some collars. We want to put 10 collars out on the ground. When we survey our bighorn sheep and everything, we'll monitor success on survival. that will give us mortality or not in through there. So, so we'll be doing a monitoring type. Uh, process with the also check on survival and help us refine our techniques. We look to be doing this three to five years. This is not a one-year deal. This year will be a little slow. Uh, we're late. We're going to be hitting some warmer temperatures, so we'll do what we can, work on our trapping technique, get that down, then be able to use numerous nets, nets next year. Um, also, some of the shooting, we're just getting warm in through there to where we can take care of the meat, so we just want to make sure that uh, we're on the ground here shortly trying things, refining it, and then get a little bit more serious next year with our effort. So, okay. With that, I'll stand by for any questions or concerns. Councilor Rick. You mentioned something about the roadkill. Can the people buy them? Yes. 
We, our officers have a road kill list that they carry with them. And also, if you listen to scanners, most people that like that will beat us to the road kill and be waiting there. Uh, sometimes it's not feasible, either time or manpower, to get an officer there if he's up at Lake Roberts or something of that nature at the end of his shift. Again, I only have two guys. That gets me one guy maybe a day on in the area type stuff. Same with uh, City PD and everything. So we get to them when we can. In warm temperatures, they spoil very fast. If they're hit bad, we just prefer to get rid of them instead of selling them. There are some guys that like hamburger meat, and we'll do that. But, yes, we uh, we do sell them when we, they are edible, and every chance we get, we do. We try to put that into use, you bet. So. Councillor Bettison. Um, I was here during the regional presentation in uh, April 2010. So um, I have a few questions sure. on the population management and hunt option, which I understand is not going to occur in Silver City. You had mentioned that the first part of it would be done by wildlife officers. Yes, sir. So that would be the, the first run that you're doing um, uh, up in areas that um, – or close to the town, but are not within the town limits. Correct. So yeah, and it's only on the larger areas where you can safely discharge firearms and stuff of that nature. It's not, it, and also what we want to focus. We have some areas where we're getting consistent lion sightings and complaints. Right. We want to hit that herd. That's the quickest way to hit that herd to thin that down. To try and change that behavior from that lion. Also, but no, it'll be in the larger areas outside of the city limits. And again, it's going to be with that landowner's permission. So, you know, because. Uh, just inside District 1 boundaries up near the, the Healy Regional um, Medical Center is where there was a Mount Lion sighting last year. And that is within town limits because that's within my district. And so, um, and it's a very regular up in that area, um, the town limits. So I was pleased to hear that it would be your officers that would be out there doing that. I guess the concern I have is um, I appreciate the desire to want to open it up to the hunters if they don't um, get a buck during that first um, season I guess January 1st to 15th did I hear that right? It's the second season. Yeah, it's the second season so um, and then having them uh, be able to go from the National Forest Boundary down to 180 just making sure that they understand that it's not National Forest Boundary all the way down to 180 because that does go into city limits in that area. As we develop that rule and regulation, all the current rules that are in place now will apply just as they cannot hunt within the city limits now. But we will put that in our information letter that we send out to them to notify them of those requirements since it's a new hunt. So, so. Okay, yeah, it's just really important because it's a discharge of any type of weapon. That That's going to be archery only is what we're looking at. And so crossbow weapon, weapon no. by yeah. your rules. Yes, no, yes. we're respecting that and don't even want to go into that. That's why it's outside. Right. So Great. And then... Um, you had mentioned on um, the, um, was it trapping? Transplant. In transplant. Yeah, mm -hmm. was it trapping? Um, on that, you were talking about a drop net and there was a clover? Clover trap. Clover, trap, clover trap is an individual deer trap. It's a six foot long by four foot high by about three foot wide steel framed netting trap. So this will be where it's real tight where we cannot get a 20 by 20 with the support structures. The problem with that is you have to put three or four there to try and keep the family group together. So it's a it's a technique that we utilize uh, to get individual deer or one or two deer at a time type thing. So it's a little bit more manpower, but it's just one of the techniques that we have available to us. Uh, and it's basically has the drop door on it. You put the bait in the back, has a trip string. They walk into it and they trip the trip string. The netting falls behind it, and then you have to go in, throw the door up, and tackle the deer inside. So. So the rodeo begins at that time. But it's a, it's a netting, nylon netting on the sides of a steel frame, just a tube frame in there. So it's one that we can move around real quick and easy in the back of the truck. So during this, because I don't know much about this, this part of the trapping part, um, in the drop net, is that something that, that there's um, actual wildlife officers present? or is yes. it So, okay. Yes. The reason I ask is because we have a lot of dog walkers that use our open spaces, you know, and that's, you know, I would just hate to see, yes. you know, yeah. <laughs> residents caught, 
you know, with their dogs. I mean, I'm just imagining that it just wouldn't yeah. that just be exciting um, um, on the front page of the Sun News, you know, or in the Daily Press or any other paper. But I, you know, I was hoping that. I mean, I realize that you um, you said that you want to make sure that you have sheltered areas or controlled areas, so that you may indeed may have to publicize that people need to stay out of a particular area through use of the, you know, by working with the town, not to go in and, and to walk in a particular part of, you know, um, of town property um, that's open space. Yes. No, and we were more than willing to do that, to get that help. That would be awesome. Uh, but to explain how that drop net works, it's not something as you walk in or underneath there's a trip spring or anything of that nature. Yeah, it's confined within a basket, and you actually have a triggering mechanism that has to be set off by a human. So you have all your manpower in place. Now it is not necessarily set, but it is up so that they are used to walking to towards it and seeing it and everything. Okay. But for the deployment of that, it's not a net that is, we do have a bigger net called a 30 by 30 that has, looks like a tent that they walk under and you leave set up the whole time and then blow the poles out and the net drops. This one's in, confined into a bucket about this big and shoots weights out at an angle okay. quite 20 and by 20. Okay. Yeah, so you're sitting there releasing that mechanism, which is a 308 cartridge, basically, just a, a firearm cartridge that shoots those weights out. So you're there on person at that time. So so we would have equipment set, and that's where that vandalism and looking loose stuff comes into, which would be our concern. But when the operation is occurring, we will have ambient manpower there to handle the deer and everything else. So. Okay, great. Thank okay. you very much. All right, you bet. Um, it seems like the limitation with the trap and transport is uh, the release. I mean, it's kind of the release is kind of crazy. Um, yes. Is there any reason why you can't just slaughter them and give them to the pantries, or is that? I mean, it seems like it'd be a lot more efficient just to slaughter. We do want to refine our techniques on trap and transplant, so we're using this as a test because this will be looked at as a statewide area. It's just not Silver City that has these type problems and everything. It's Red River, Rio Doce, so everything. So where we get these concentrations. That is one mechanism. That's why we're doing the kill permit there. But we also want to refine techniques. This is the first time we're using this particular net on this operation or any operation. We tried it on turkeys, and the turkeys were too fast. So we're refining things as we get in there. So we're wanting to use this also as some testing opportunities so, to refine that. Uh, in terms of just slaughtering at that time, we'd like to try and get some deer out there on the ground also. There's nothing wrong with that. We're going to work on some soft release studies also in the future, so this is part of a bigger thing as we go forward with our trap and transplant uh, plan statewide. So. What's the difference between soft and hard? Soft release is actually where you build a pin to hold them for a week or two to get acclimated to the area. Uh, so you'd have a big 12-foot high fence that may be an acre, two acre, three acre type deal that where you would hold them before you open the gate and let them out into the area. So there's a little bit more acclimation going on there. It's an expensive deal. You have to have people checking on them. You have to have the place to do it, and you have to have uh, a lot of things go on. Fort Stanton, we've done it there, and it's been successful. So we want to refine those type things also, too. So, so the transport, there's, there's biological reasons more than just the yeah. uh, political reasons of not both. wanting to. Both. We're aware of both of them. Believe me, this is something that we're being asked to do. It's almost easier to say we have deer live with them, uh, but we're being asked by numerous people to address some problems that they have, uh, but there's definitely the political aspect to any decision that you make, and we're aware of that, uh, but it is one that we, well within our means as an agency to do, too, you know, because we do other trap and transplant operations. It may, it may make it easier for us to help you with that if we had an idea of what the cost effectiveness is. Um, and how effective it actually is with the hard and soft releases. Right. And those are the things through the monitoring that we'll try and figure out. So, yeah. And you haven't done this anywhere else? Not in this urban type setting. We've done it for uh, Rocky Mountain, Bighorn Sheep, uh, Antelope, and Elk, but not on mule deer in the term of the sense of a transplant. We have done some hard releases in Farmington that were not successful. We did one in Roswell with the soft release that we did have some success. We did one in the Boot Hill down on the Cowans that we had mixed results in. The, we released them in the Borough Mountains from, from the Boot Hill down there. So we do have experience. We know it's expensive. We know there's some problems there. Some of it ties into the habitat conditions and everything, and sometimes you just don't know until you do it. So. 
Councillor Benson. I got off on one other thing. Okay. You had mentioned essentially a temptation um, for the residents, not just our residents of town, but um, county residents about let's not feed the deer. Yes. Um, and so there wasn't really anything that addressed uh, education. Right. That'll be news releases and then just everybody that we've contacted and that's where you get into some neighborhood issues in through there. Uh, we put out that information, but you'll also see some news releases and coming up on the concerns with feeding uh, at a much bigger level. That's uh, known to be at the state level also too. So. Yeah, I mean, because that was part of the discussion in April. Yes. We actually had a former counselor that mentioned in public that that they Fed actually me. fed. Yes, fed it is a popular bike time. So. It is, but it also has created many of the problems that we're seeing today. Yes. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Right. The time to keep us educated on, on what's going on to resolve the issue. I also, when we were at the game commission meeting in Santa Fe, there was a mention that the people actually applying for hunting permits in those zones was dropping. That was one of the plans, and as, as you deal with public meetings and commissions and things get tweaked and turned, we don't feel, and it still may come about, we may have to create a hunt, specific hunt for doe in this area type deal. That's one I'm trying to stay away from then try and roll over the tags so we have the people from here that hunt around here that know the people. If you create a hunt zone, you could get somebody from Albuquerque that would not know the people or who to go talk to to get permission because it's going to be all on private property. And that's something that has to be out there because we're not allowing that to go on into the forest. We're just on the private property where we're having the problems. So we want people to have some on the ground knowledge of the area and the people. So. So when you open it up statewide, you get some folks that may have a different expectation to what they're getting when they show up on the ground. So, but that is one that will be discussed at commission level, I guarantee it. So. Do you know why or care to speculate why the people are not asking for permits in, the, in those zones? Archery, we, we increase our archery tags. There are people that hunt archery in these units and everything, but we've increased our tags in that to try and attract people to the secondary weapon types, the muzzle loading and the archery because there's less success rate so we can have more people out in the field at the same time opportunity wise. So we've also kind of created that problem of having a high number of tags out there that there's just not as many people partaking in that type of sport is also. So we want to keep them going and giving them opportunity if they do not get their but deer a chance to get some meat for the freezer and help out on this situation. So it's an idea. We'll see what our commission does, as you guys are aware of. So, <laughs> so. thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Still under reports, Mr. Brown. Mr. Russell, you're what? Like when I'm short, please. You're always short. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. And would you like to report? Yes, I'd like to thank all of you for mentioning the upcoming election and encouraging people to vote. The election is next Tuesday, March 6th, and um, early voting ends at City Hall this Friday. So if you, if you aren't available on Election Day to go to your polls, Please come to City Hall and vote early. Uh, Friday's the last day, 5 p.m. The polling locations, we do have one new polling location that I'd like to announce if you haven't heard already. So I'll go through all four of them. District 1 is at the Silver City Women's Club. District 2 is new. It used to be the library. It's no longer at the library. Now it's at Jose Barrios Elementary School. District 3 is at the Silver City Senior Center, and District 4 is at the Knights of Columbus. And I guess that's about it, unless you've got some questions. Nope. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing 
Approval disapproval of ordinance number 1199, a zone change request for a parcel addressed as 1412 North Bennett Street, Silver City, New Mexico. The request is to amend the official zoning map for that property described as lot 16 and 8, block 267 of the Fraser edition from commercial district to mixed use district. The applicant is Darlene Don Gray. The town council will serve as the hearing board and I as the mayor will be the presiding officer. Have any members of this hearing board had ex parte discussion with any person regarding the subject matter of this hearing or had any communication from any party to this case? No. no, no sir. All of you are qualified. Will all parties and witnesses intending to testify, including those staff members who intend to present testimony or who will be available for questioning, please rise and come to the podium to be sworn in by the town clerk. If you have not been sworn, you will not be permitted to testify or otherwise participate in this hearing. In the manner before this council. In the manner before this council. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Under penalty of perjury. Under penalty of perjury. Thank you. The hearing will be conducted as follows. The town staff shall present a brief synopsis of the application based on the application or actions taken by director, by PNZ commission, or by town staff. Then the applicant shall present their case. Next will come witnesses in support of the applicant's case. The applicant, staff, or witnesses may then be questioned by the hearing board. The presiding officer will then ask the applicant if that concludes its case in chief and states that the proponent and its witnesses will remain available to be further questioned by the hearing board, by staff, or by opponents to the application. Following the close of the applicant's case, witnesses in opposition to the applicant's case shall be permitted to testify, during the course of which the witness may address questions to any previous witness but such questions shall be made through the presiding officer. The presiding officer shall have the sole discretion in directing the question for response, considering whether the question is relevant as cumulative to other testimony or is otherwise inappropriate. At the close of testimony against the application, the presiding officer asks the applicant, is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? And then we'll have questions and make a decision. Mr. Coates, staff. Tonight we're going to be looking at a couple of zone changes. The first one is a map amendment zone change request with the ordinance 1199 for 1412 North Bennett. And it's the owner is Darlene Don Gray. Um, 1412 North Bennett is currently in the commercial district. And it was historically uh, primarily a residential area, but is transitioning into a commercial area. Um, several properties in the neighborhood have already been rezoned to accommodate their residential use. Um, some prior to the land use code change um, in 2010 and a couple since then. Um, the mixed use district is what we're looking at change or proposing the change for from the commercial into. Um, mixed use district accommodates small scale commercial and residential um, and it's a transitional zone between commercial and residential areas. It's one of the new zones that were um, put in place with the new land use code in 2010. Um, the Bennett Street north of 14th Street, you can see there's commercial on one side of the street, primarily residential on the other. And this is the residence that Ms. Gray would like to have change to the mixed use district rather than having it as a commercial area because she is not able to take advantage of residential financing 
for her property. Um, most of the property on that side of the street is currently being used as residential except for one corner property, which looks like it's a residence, but it's actually a Brocom facility. Um, this is the property just north of the subject property, and the um, when the Planning and Zoning Commission met to review the map amendment change on February 7th, they had to come up with one of those findings. Um, there's seven findings according to the land use code. Would you like me to read them into the record or? No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, they, they did go with four findings. They, they agreed that there were four findings that could be considered appropriate for changing and those were the proposed amendment is in substantial compliance with the town's comprehensive plan. The proposed amendment will not adversely affect the implementation of the goals and policies of the town's comprehensive plan. The proposed amendment will not adversely impact the public health, safety, or general welfare and will promote the original purposes of the land use code. The proposed amendment provides additional flexibility in meeting the objectives of this land use code without lowering the standards of the land use code. There were no neighbors who testified or commented in opposition to the proposed amendment. Any questions on the staff report? Would the applicant like to present your case? I'm Darlene Don Gray. I'm the owner of 1412 North Bennett Street. And uh, I, after we purchased this property, found out that it was in the commercial zone and that it uh, would be very difficult to get financing if the building... Hold that microphone a little closer. We're... Anyhow, uh, with the commercial zoning as it is, it's very difficult to either sell the building to someone that wants to use it as a residence, which is its current use. Also, if I were to try to uh, replace or rebuild in the case of a loss, such as fire, I would have to go with a commercial uh, loan on it, which is considerably higher interest rate. Um, also, there's a restriction of 25% if I wanted to in increase the size of the building under its current uh, zoning. And if it's rezoned, then I could just respond to the maximum size allowed by the town. Um, do, you, do you want me to go through the findings again, or as Mr. Coates did? Or? If, if you have any comments on, on or objections to any of the findings. No, mm -mm, not at all. Try and keep it short. That's up to you. I'm not going to restrict your testimony, or it, you feel free to say whatever you think you need to say that's pertinent to getting a decision. In. Well, I believe that the proposed rezoning is in substantial compliance with the town's comprehensive plan and won't adversely affect the public or anybody. So, thank you. Thank you. Any anybody else in support of the applicant's case? Is there any opposition to the applicant's case? Is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? Okay. She indicated no. Does any member of the board have any questions? Is the hearing board prepared to consider the application and render its decision? Yes. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Councilor. I move for approval of ordinance number 1199, a zone change request for a parcel addressed as 1412 North Bennett Street, Silver City, New Mexico. The, the request is to amend the official zoning map for that property describes a described as lot 6 and 8, block block 267 of the Fraser edition from commercial district to mixed-use district. The applicant is Darlene Don Gray. Under the uh, 
Finding number seven, the proposed amendment provides additional flexibility in meeting the objectives of this land use code without lowering the standards of the land use code. Mr. Mayor, I second the motion to stay. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second, no discussion, to approve ordinance number 1199, a zone change request for a parcel addressed as 1412 North Bennett Street, Silver City, New Mexico. The request is to amend the official zoning map for that property described as lot 6 and 8, block 267 of the Frazier edition from commercial district to mixed use district. The applicant is Darlene Dawn Gray, and we're using finding number 7 as stated. Roll call. Aye. Council Gray. Aye. Council Jackson. Aye. Council Bettison. Aye. Motion carries, and that concludes this hearing. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing entitled Approval Disapproval of Ordinance Number 1200, a request for a map amendment zone change for a tract of land addressed as 503 Spring Street, Silver City, New Mexico, which is currently in two zoning districts. The parcel is described as part of lots 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15 of Block 27 of the Frazier edition. The request is to amend the official zoning map for that portion of the property within the commercial district to historic downtown commercial district. The applicants are Robert and Mary Ann Ryman. The town council will serve as the hearing board and I as mayor will be the presiding officer. Have any members of this hearing board had ex parte discussions with any person regarding the subject matter of this hearing or had any communication from any party to this case? No, sir. No, sir. Hearing none, you're all qualified. Will all parties and witnesses intending to testify, including those staff members who intend to present testimony or who will be available for questioning, please rise, come to the podium to be sworn in by the town clerk. If you have not been sworn, you will not be permitted to testify or otherwise participate in this hearing. The hearing will be conducted as follows. The town staff shall present a brief synopsis of the application based on the application or actions taken by the director, by PNZ commission, or by town staff. Then the applicant shall present their case. Next will come witnesses in support of the applicant's case. The applicant, staff, or witnesses may then be questioned by the hearing board. The presiding officer will then ask the applicant if that concludes its case in chief and states that the proponent and its witness will remain available to be further questioned by the hearing board, by staff, or by opponents to the application. Following the close of the applicant's case, witnesses in opposition to the applicant's case shall be permitted to testify, during the course of which the witnesses may address questions to any previous witness, but such questions shall be made through the presiding officer. The presiding officer shall have the sole discretion in directing the question for response, considering whether the question is relevant, is cumulative to other testimony, or is otherwise inappropriate. At the close of testimony against the application, the presiding officer will ask the applicant, is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? Then we will ask questions and make a decision. Mr. Coates. Um, this is a, another map amendment zone change request um, based on Ordinance 1200 to change part of 503 Spring Street, that, that part of the parcel that is in the commercial zone, to historic downtown commercial. Um, it is a, an interesting piece because it has 
two zones in the property. Um, the, the property actually has eight lots, and four of them are commercially zoned, and four of them are resident, residentially zoned right now. The house happens to be in the um, commercial part of the, of the property. It is in an area of town that we're looking at eventually um, bringing about a major change in the zone from commercial to the historic downtown commercial, which is was set up again in the 2010 land use code change. And the historic downtown commercial district is to accommodate a mix of commercial uses and residential uses, um, mixed use buildings, and all compatible with the historic district and also provide um, vitality through diverse activities conveniently accessible to pedestrians. Um, I wanted to bring this particular slide to your attention because it, it um, provides some awareness of the difficulty of changing or making a broad sweep of, a, of its own change. This is the blue represents the current residential district. The red represents the current commercial district. The property right here is the subject property. There's four lots that are, are zoned commercial, four lots that are zoned residential. We outlined the various parcels on in those five blocks that would show you why there might be some concern about how we go about changing in a broad way the um, commercial into the downtown histor or the historic downtown commercial district. This property is split by the zone. This property is split by the zone. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this and this, nine properties in a five block area. Um, there's two theories, or probably more than two theories in planning of how to draw a zoning line. Some people say the zone line should be drawn along a street. Some say it should be drawn between the streets. The reason for drawing the line between the streets is so that each street front would have the same zone. Um, some people say that it's, it would be easier because you wouldn't have these kind of complications if you drew the zone line along the street. I wanted to bring this to your attention because I know that you as a council um, have had questions of why the major map change has not occurred yet. Also, we've had public input and, and the Planning and Zoning Commission is also a very wanting to see that happen. Um, we've, the planning department has come up with a time frame of about a year that we are will be able to make some broad changes based on the new land use code uh, to the map, the zone map that we have. Um, that's if the community accepts that and uh, the council approves the, the map changes later. This is a, a, a picture of the residents in the commercial zone on 503 Spring Street. And this is this, the street in front of the house of Spring. Or that was, and here's Baird Street. I'm, I'm just going to kind of go around the block showing you what the, what the um, property looks like and, and what is the surrounding neighborhood. This is the backyard. The actual zone change occurs right about at this line here rather than all of it being in the house or all of um, the property being on one zone. This is um, Baird Street looking south or north towards town and you have multi-tenant multi housing here. You have single family residence there. Um, looking, down Coop, or looking down Bremen Street, the property with the white fence is the backyard of the subject property. This is looking north on Cooper. This is a multi-family unit here. And we have some commercial properties down this direction on Cooper Street. This is the, the boundary line between the 
the subject property at 503 and the apartment building next door to it. These are the findings required for the council to make the map change, and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended the map change based on four findings, the same four as were in the previous hearing. Would you like me to read through those? Pardon? Just take the numbers. Okay. The numbers of the findings that are listed in the land use code that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended the change could be based on are 1, 2, 4, and 7. So, any questions? No questions. Councilor Moranis. I may have just missed it, but there was no opposition There was no opposition. There were questions what a major change would be, what it would entail for the neighborhood, and also there were questions from neighbors as, what does this mean to my property? So, but there was no one that said, I'm opposed to this zone change. No one at all. They appeared satisfied with the People were satisfied with the explanations that we were able to give them and told them that when we did make, did go through with the broader zone change, that we would be having neighborhood meetings, public hearings. They would be notified of any changes. Thank you. Thank you. Now the applicant can present your case. My name is Paul Chano. I'm a licensed real estate agent for the state of New Mexico. I represent Mr. and Mrs. Reinman in this matter. I represent them. I have a written listing agreement with them to sell their property. One of the things that we've come across in trying to sell their property is by law in our listing agreement, as well as our MLS, we have to state the zoning that the property falls in. And because the residence itself falls in commercial, I have to put that as such, which significantly limits the amount of people that are in the position to be able to possibly buy this house, because the way it stands right now, they'd not be able to get a residential loan. When my clients bought the house, they bought on a real estate contract without the use of a bank, and it wasn't an issue at that point in time. Their intention was to retire here, but because of illness in the family, that changed the situation, so that's when they decided to put it on the market. I've had a number of inquiries on it, as well as a number of, I should say, a couple of contracts on the property that fell through because of the inability to get the proper financing on it. So that's why we're applying for such. Interesting thing about this home, if you've seen it, is it's a grand old home. It was built back in the 50s, and it's my understanding that it was actually built for the mayor of Silver City at the time. As it stands vacant, unfortunately now, and there's not the pride of ownership, so to speak, that it is falling in somewhat disrepair. It needs a good paint job. It needs some other things to be taken care of. And the best way to do that is to get someone into the house who loves it and cares for it the way it should be. So that's why we're applying for the zone change. Is there any witnesses in support of the applicant's case? Might as well stay there, Paul. Are there any witnesses in opposition to the applicant's case? Is there anything else you wish to be reflected in the record? The only thing, Mr. Mayor and Council, is that I'd like to thank the Community Planning and Development Department for all the help in this matter. They were very professional. Mr. Coates, Mr. Russell, and Jamie, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. They were very helpful in the matter and treated it in a very professional manner. Thank you. Does any member of the hearing board have any questions for any witness? No. Is the hearing board prepared to consider this application and render its decision? Yes, sir. Entertain a motion? Mr. Mayor. Counselor. I move for approval of ordinance number 1200, a request for a map amendment zone change for a tract of land address at 503 Spring Street, Silver City, New Mexico, which is currently in two zoning districts. The parcel is described as part of lots 1, 3, 
5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15, Block 27 of the Fraser Edition. The request is to amend the official zoning map for that portion of the property within the commercial district to historic downtown commercial district. The applicants are Robert and Miriam Miriam Reinman. Based on uh, finding number seven, the proposed amendment provides additional flexibility in meeting the objectives of this land use code without lowering the standards of the land use code. Is there a second? Mr. Mayor, I second that motion as stated. There's a motion and a second to approve. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second, no discussion, to approve ordinance number 1200, a request for a map amendment zone change for attractive land addressed as 503 Spring Street, Silver City, New Mexico, which is currently in two zoning districts. The parcel is described as parts, part of lots 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15, block 27 of the Fraser edition. The request is to amend the official zoning map for that portion of the property within the commercial district to historic downtown commercial district. The applicants are Robert and Marianne Raymond. Roll call, please. Council Wright. Aye. Council Wright. Aye. Council Thompson. Aye. Council Bess. Aye. Motion carries, and that concludes this hearing. I just, Peter, I. I I think we need to have a discussion at some point because, for one, there's an application fee for all these zone changes, and this is really no fault of the landowner that the map is just wrong. And I think until we can get the, the map amended and actually make it what the town intends for the town to, to look like and the proper controls and the proper neighborhoods and houses and commercial districts, I just really struggle with this. We just keep collecting money from people who have to come and jump through hoops. Um, I, I uh, understand your concern, Mr. Mayor. Um, I uh, am anxious to move forward at a larger scale. Um, and the, the, the issue has two parts to it that are complicating. Um, the edges are complicated to do because properties often overlap into two zones. And so uh, what you have to think about is the consequence to the neighboring zone in an overlap area that we talked about. So the edges are quite difficult to do. The center is quite easy to do. The, the other complicating element, however, is that um, <clears throat> in this instance, um, people are uh, seeking the change because they see it as helping them. But when you go to people and say, we're here to change your zone, don't worry, it's going to help you out, they have questions. They get concerned. Um, a lot of the uh, issues surrounding the neighbors have to do with, is this going to affect me? How is it going to affect my property? So those are very real, genuine questions that need to be answered and require a, sort of a larger initiative of, you know, public meetings, you know, notifications to, say, groups of 100 people or whatever. We think we need to do that. We want to move forward with it. We've had some changes in the staffing. We feel now we have a right array of talent to move forward, and we'll be doing that. But we also want to continue to uh, as we prepare for this larger initiative, deal with the issues um, as they come up for people who need some kind of resolution right away. Um, one suggestion, perhaps, uh, would be that the um, council could direct uh, staff on the uh, individual zone changes uh, to waive the fee uh, to, so that uh, there's still a process in place. The neighbors have an opportunity to be heard, but the people aren't being penalized in the way you pointed out. You know, that's, that's really my concern when we, we look at the map that was just up on the wall. It's, it's obvious that it's, it's just wrong. We found areas that are just everything on the ground is residential. 
residential A, B, and their zone commercial. And people, for whatever reason, I mean, we've, we've heard sad stories for just about anything. And it's just that the map is wrong. And that's, that's really our doing. I agree. Um, one thing that we often hear in the, the commercial areas that are largely residential, when we notify the neighbors, the applicant wants the change because they have some kind of hardship. The neighbor is holding on to the commercial property designation because they feel that they're going to get some kind of benefit out of it in the future. And so people are risk averse to change. We think that we need to educate people. We think that the large scale uh, changes are needed. We're aligning ourselves to do that. We're trying to figure out how big a bite we take at each time. But we hope within the year to, to complete these changes that we presented to you uh, in the land use code um, uh, review process. I appreciate that. I, I think we can we can come forward later on with some some amendments. This isn't on the agenda, so we we can't take any action on it. But I I think it should be looked at. And I mean, we heard as we developed the land use code, there was many people came and testified over great concerns over how their property would end up. So. I appreciate that it's going to be a very complex and lengthy, drawn-out process, but I, I still think we have some issues that we could actually make it easier for some of those that it's just zoned wrong. Yes, sir. So we'll follow up. Thank you. Councillor Bettison. Mr. Mayor, I move for a short break. Is there a second? Okay. There's a motion and a second for a short break. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We're in recess. We will call this meeting back to order. And the next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of ordinance number 1196, an ordinance authorizing the execution and delivery of a power purchase agreement by and between the town of Silver City and NRG Solar Silver City LLC for the purpose of obtaining guaranteed savings in town's cost of electricity during the term of the power purchase agreement and providing for the pledge of utility cost savings for the purpose of securing payment of amounts due under the power purchase agreement, ratifying action previous taken in connection therewith, repealing action in conflict herewith. Mr. Brown. This is basically ratifying an agreement between the Town of Silver City and NRG Solar Silver City LLC for the uh, purchase of uh, solar power uh, to to run the wastewater treatment plant for a period of 20 years at a set price of uh, 0.69 cents per kilowatt hour. 6.9 6. 6. 6. cents per kilowatt hour uh, over the next 20 years. There will be no increase to the to the cost of uh, for the purchase of the the um, the the power. Uh, that we purchased from NRG, they will be be building a one megawatt a solar facility adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant, and uh, this basically would um, we would are only dedicating the water sewer funds, which we currently use already to uh, pay for electrical costs for uh, the operation of the wastewater treatment plant itself. Uh, so uh, it's either pay NRG a set price over the next uh, 20 years or pay P&M uh, whatever rate they get uh, from the PRC over the next 20 years. Uh, the calculated savings is in the range of $4 million over the next 20 years by entering into this agreement. Questions? Comments, questions from the audience? 
comments, questions from the board? So, you know, what if, is there any risk that's been identified to the town? There were several early on. They've been eliminated one by one, and at this point, there is no risk to the town. And is this dependent upon Energy Solar Silver City LLC maintaining qualified status as a corporation and any sort of corporate stability? There are, uh, this contract is freely assignable by NRG, both in, as, uh, to a successor corporation providing solar energy, or, uh, if it goes bankrupt, then it's freely uh, assignable as collateral to financiers who, uh, would continue to operate in order to derive the revenue from the operation. So there would be no way that they could put a, any other additional liens on on what they need to sell us this power that could jeopardize our future ability to have the power at the same rate. No, there's uh, there's nothing that there's no escalator clause. There are remedies if we if we decide not to pay them. Uh, that would be a breach of contract on our part, on the town's part. And they do have remedies for collecting that money. Uh, if we uh, decide to terminate the agreement after they invest four or five or six million dollars in a pro and then we say we changed our mind, we're not going to buy your power, that would yield some remedies for them and we'd be on the hook. But in the absence of uh, a gross and willful or criminal intent or conduct, or terminating, wrongfully terminating the agreement without cause, there is no risk to the town. Thank you. There, there are some remedies in, in the case that they are unable to provide power to the town, uh, whereby they would make up the difference between what it costs us to purchase power from PNM at, at the time and what our contracted rate is with them cur current under this contract for a period of one year. That way it would give us a, a year so that we could go out and find another uh, arrangement to replace them. Thank you. Councilor Moronis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this ordinance seems very uh, tied to the, the following uh, notice of intent. Does this obligate us to move in a certain direction on the, 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 the next action item, or are we free to debate that, and irregardless of what happens there, it, does this set us in a path where we have to move in the other, on the other action items, or are we free to debate and, and work on that independently? You can, it's independent in the sense that uh, it doesn't kill this deal. However, the next, the, and you're talking about the IRB, the Industrial Revenue Bond NOI. That, when this plant is built at, at a value of five or six million dollars, in the absence of the IRB, it will be taxed, property tax, ad valorem tax, which is quite substantial. There is a provision in the state statutes that allows, that provides a mechanism for taking that project off of the tax rolls. And by taking it off the tax rolls, it allows us to have the 6.9 cent per kilowatt hour rate. If there was no tax benefit, then the rate would be adjusted upward. So instead of gaining uh, 6.9, the rates would have to be recalculated in order to cover the expense to the company of paying these taxes. Fortunately, the state has an IRB process that looks to these, these large 
public interest projects finds a mechanism to get it off the tax rolls to get maximum benefit to the parties. So the consequence of approving the IRB or not approving it would be what the, the final rate assessed upon the town. Right now, the 6.9 is based on an assumption that the IRB will pass. If it is not passed, that rate will be adjusted upward. Is there any, um, have we done any calculations as to... We, we're, we're, we, um, we're calculating about a $4, a $4 million benefit um, in, in light of all that assumption. If this, uh, the IRB was not to pass, have, do we have a, a different calculation on our savings? Yes, the savings would be less, but it still would be probably well above three million. And uh, I think that I, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Uh, Duffy, our bond counsel for the IRB, might be able to to go into those numbers. Uh, I think that probably Nick Cicillo would maybe uh, better able to tell you that that number. And my question, and where I'm, I'm motivated, is I want to I, I do want this to be independent. I want to make a, an independent decision on this, irregardless of what happens after this. And so, worst case scenario is we're still going to be yielding a, around a three million dollar benefit. Is is from your calculation? Somewhere in the, but again, the exact dollar amount we we can't really. It, it's, it, it's all it, dependent it's on what happens with PNM and mm -hmm. PRC and okay. those types of things. In the initial, in the analysis of our savings, the I think that what was used was a very modest PNM rate increase, probably three percent a year, and that might end up being highly unrealistic. We're looking at the most conservative savings would be around four million. So it would be a financial impact. That's that's question. Even after we we act on this and if it's passed, then there's actually a separate contract that's signed between the two parties. The the you're authorizing the town manager. Well, you're authorizing the town to to sign to execute this power purchase agreement. The IRB would have no value if you didn't have this PPA signed. So the sequence is that now you're signing, if you vote in favor of this, you pass the PPA. There is the qualifier that if you don't pass the bond issue, that the rate, w that every other provision in this agreement will stay the same except that the final calculation of the rate and the final determination of the saving, the, the anticipated saving, will change to reflect this tax. But they are two very separate agreements, but one is absolutely conditioned precedent to the other. Without a PPA, there's no, no purpose of talking about the, the IRB. Any other questions? Entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Council. I move for approval of ordinance number 1196, an, order, an ordinance authorizing the execution and delivery of a power purchase agreement by and between the Town of Silver City and NRG Solar Silver City LLC for the purpose of obtaining guaranteed savings in, in the town's cost of electricity during the term of the power purchase agreement and providing for the pledge of utility cost savings for the purpose of securing payments of amounts due under the purchase power agreement, ratifying action previously taken in connection therewith, repealing all action in conflict therewith. Is there a motion and a second to approve? Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 1196 as read and presented on the agenda. A roll call, please. Councilor Morales. Aye. Councilor Hay. Aye. Councilor Thompson. Aye. Councilor Gasson. Aye. Motion carries.
Next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of notice of intent ordinance number 1195, an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of the town of Silver City, New Mexico industrial revenue bond NRG Solar Silver City LLC project, a series 2012 in the maximum principal amount of $4 million to provide funds to finance the acquisition, construction, and equipping of a solar power facility for the purpose of generating electricity, authorizing the execution and delivery of an indenture, a lease agreement, a bond purchase agreement, bond, and other documents in connection with the issuance of the bond and the project, making certain determinations and findings related to the bond and project, ratifying certain actions taken previously, and repealing all actions inconsistent with this ordinance. Mr. Brown. Is towns, uh, bond council uh, that we've obtained who specializes in these types of transactions to represent the town to help explain it. Um, as Alex said, my name is Eddie Duffy, and I am uh, issuer's counsel in connection with this proposed industrial revenue bond issuance. What's on the agenda tonight is the notice of intent to consider the ordinance for the bonds. It's not the uh, approval of the ordinance itself, but just the, um, the, the notice of intent to consider. If approved uh, tonight, uh, the council would then consider the formal adoption of the ordinance and the related uh, bond documents at the meeting on March 27th. But in anticipation of that uh, meeting, I thought I'd uh, provide a sort of brief overview of what an industrial revenue bond is and most importantly what it isn't, um, and highlight how these are structured, and then wanted to introduce just a, an amendment to the form of ordinance here that it's primarily just to, to clarify uh, the scope of the, um, of, the, uh, of the municipality in connection with the issuance of these bonds. Um, so what industrial revenue bonds are is they're not like your typical bonds that the city would issue where the city actually uses its own funds to finance projects. Industrial revenue bonds are more of a device that um, cities have at their disposal to provide tax incentives for certain projects. The bonds are not paid back by the city. The city does not use its own funds to pay the bonds. What's uh, used to pay the bonds are mon monies paid by the developer to the to the city, and then the city then transfers those to the bond purchaser. Um, and in fact, under the IRB statute, um, bonds can't constitute an indebtedness of the uh, municipality under the state constitutional provisions. Um, bonds can never give rise to a pecuniary liability of the municipality or a charge against uh, its credit or taxing powers. So um, the city is not the financing party here. Uh, a party asking for an IRB has to bring its own financing to the table or else the, you know, the bonds and the project won't move forward. What the city does give as part of the industrial revenue bond a transaction is a tax abatement to the developer. And this is particular to the structure of the IRBs and the way it works is the developer will transfer title to the land and the project to the, to the town and thus when the assessor goes to assess the taxes, that property will be titled in the name of the town, and thus there's no, no tax on that piece. The town just holds, holds title for the purposes of the tax abatement. Uh, it's not, uh, the, the project isn't listed as an asset on the, um, on the town's balance sheet. It's actually carried as an asset on the developer's balance sheet. But with that title, then, the town leases the project to the developer. The developer would pay rent, which would be equivalent to the debt service on the bonds, and so that money would go from the developer to the bond purchaser. And in this case, the bond purchaser is an affiliate of the um, developer itself. So essentially the way the bonds are going to be paid for is the company will essentially pay one of its affiliates and um, the, the town assigns all of its rights to receive that rent directly to the affiliate bond purchaser. Um, and in terms of the administration of the IRBs, there is really no administrative duty imposed on the town. The, the depository and the company itself are responsible for that. The town's primary responsibilities are just holding the title um, for the term of the bonds. And 
and it receives notices as to what's happening with the bonds, if there's any defaults in the bonds, if there's any sort of changes that are pertinent to the bonds, they'll receive notice. But there really isn't a lot of administrative duty or resources that the towns need to impose on, I'm sorry, need to incur in connection with the administration of the bonds. And one thing before I forget, there is a slight amendment to the form of ordinance, and it's more for clarification. Under the IRB Act, municipalities are authorized to issue industrial revenue bonds for projects located within their boundaries and within 15 miles of their corporate boundaries. The form of ordinance here has two sections which provide that the projects are going to be located within the town, and what we want to add to those sections is, and within 15 miles of the corporate limits of the town. So, you know, I understand that the project is located outside of the corporate boundaries, but within that 15-mile radius. So the municipality is authorized to issue these bonds. And those two amendments would occur on, I think it's page 2 of 10. The second whereas from the top, which is whereas pursuant to sections 3-32-1 through 3-32-16, NMSA 1978 as amended, the town is And after that sentence, we'd add, and within 15 miles of the corporate limit of the town. And then the one other similar change is on page 4 of 10. It's under section 2, part B4, and the sentence reads, the project property is located within, and then instead of the town, the change would be within 15 miles of the corporate limits of the town. And I think with that said, I'm happy to stand for any questions you might have. Can we discuss the school board's involvement? Oh, absolutely. Industrial revenue bonds, which are for electrical generation facilities, need to be approved by the school board as well. And there are usually two parts to that approval. One is sort of the general approval of the project. Another one is whether the school board is going to want what's called a payment in lieu of taxes. Because these bonds offer tax relief, sometimes school districts will want a portion of those taxes they have paid back to them. And I understand the school has been notified of this project. They're taking it under consideration, and they will have their meeting scheduled the week before the town council meeting in which you're going to consider this ordinance. And presumably at that time, you'll have the approval of the project and determination as to whether there's going to be any payment in lieu of taxes required by the school district. Do you want to say anything? I've been in contact with Mr. Booth. He asked me for an estimate of what they would be giving up over the 20-year period. I had Brian Cassett do a worst-case scenario for the 20-year period. And I also asked the assessor to see if he could give me an estimate. He wasn't able to give me an assessment because apparently the formula is very complicated and depends on a lot of different criteria. So we did send over an estimate over the 20-year period. I believe that the reason that the schools have this stipulation in the school districts have this stipulation in the IRB process is because in cases in which an electric generating facility brings in 200 jobs, the school districts themselves are going to have to 
make up and have that additional expense of providing um, services to the children of those 200 employees that it may bring in. Um, in this case, there will be no jobs provided. Um, they'll have uh, maintenance people coming in periodically to maintain the, the facility. Uh, the only thing that it, it, the, um, this, this project will do for the schools is actually stabilize and um, keep theirs as well as the rest of the, the, um, the constituency of, of, of the town of Silver City uh, who received uh, wastewater services, give them a, a stable um, electrical operating cost over the next 20 years, which will be a savings to everyone. So that, that, our, that was passed, to, passed on to Mr. Poole, and he told me that he would pass it on to the school board. And the town's request on the pilot is zero? Is zero, yes. Any, any questions from the audience? Come on. In the bond papers, or John Crow, okay, hi. In the bond papers, there is a, a name of a co LLC company called SPP. Silver City Bond Purchaser, LLC. But we've never heard their name. We know who NRG Solar Silver City LLC is. <clears throat> but there is no... And the PRC, the NRG Solar Silver City exists. But in the PRC, there is no such entity as SPP Silver City Bond Purchaser, LLC doesn't exist. And we've heard that they are a subsidiary, <clears throat> but that's not a name. And this is due to the structure of the bonds, which is called a, a self-purchase. So, um, you know, not don't have representatives for NRG here, but I can just tell you generally how this works. You would have a uh, uh, an entity that's either formed in New Mexico or qualified to do business in, the, in New Mexico as the developer, which in this case is the, the NRG uh, solar, uh, uh, solar LLC. But independently, they create a, a, usually a special subsidiary to act as the bondholder, and that entity doesn't really conduct any operations in New Mexico. Its function is primarily just to, to act as the bondholder, and the financing is done uh, primarily through NRG funding its subsidiary. Um, that's why these deals are called self-purchases, because it's really there's not really an independent third party financing the deal. It's uh, NRG using its own funds to finance it. But since you need a bond purchaser in order to have the industrial revenue bond transaction, they uh, set up a, an affiliate company or subsidiary to hold that. But since that company doesn't really have any material operations in New Mexico, a lot of times that the bond purchaser won't, won't qualify to do business. In New required to register with the PRC as a corporation? It, it depends on their level of activity in New Mexico, but you know, a lot of times when, and this is really more of a question for NRG, but, but in a lot of these bond deals they wouldn't register in New Mexico because their only function is holding a bond issued by a, uh, under an IRB transaction and they don't have any real operations, so uh, a lot of times they wouldn't uh, qualified to do business because there aren't any real operations in New Mexico. But there's still an important part of the the partnership. Right. Yeah, so they're the they're the financing part. Well, they're the part. The one of the parties that's going to be doing the financing. But since they don't have any real like operations on the ground, um, and they're just a, a, a bond a bondholder essentially. Um, a lot of states wouldn't qualify them to do business. They they do have to be an actual company, and you know most of these are formed as Delaware Limited Liability Companies. Um, but in, in terms of actually qualifying, um, uh, you know a lot of them don't qualify to do business in the state because they are just a bondholder. Mr. Scarborough. 
They will be a legal entity for purpose of contract. Correct. Whether they have to register with the state of New Mexico, the state of New Mexico requires any foreign corporation conducting business. And there's some ambiguity as to what level of interaction do you have to have in the state to be considered conducting business. So there's two separate issues. One, is this a legal entity with which we can contract with or with the bond purchaser? Are they a legal entity? And number two, is their level of business activity within the state? Does that justify PRC registration? And if they don't register, we still have a binding contract. If they get in trouble with the PRC, that's that's their attorney's call, whether they have to register or not. And for safety's sake, if it was my client, I would recommend that they do register, play it safe. And I've already made that suggestion to Mr. Brian Cassett of the of NRG. Well, and historically, you've been the one that that drills people when they come in and ask for doing business with the town that involves a corporation that we'd be able to identify the corporation, identify the partners in the corporation, identify any kind of trouble that they may have been in so that we ensure that our that all of our partnerships are above board and and decent. And that's where my questioning is coming from, is we need to be able to ensure everybody, the public, that this is an above board company that we're getting into into business with. And and I believe that's where the questioner was coming from, is you can do research and find all these other companies that we we do business with. And you pull this one up and it's absent or it shows up as a company in Dubai if you just put in SPP. So that's that's the line of questioning that I'm going at is we need to make sure that that we have our security in these companies that we do business with. We have a vested interest in their stability as well. We the we know that it that the normal device is to set up a straw company to be the bond purchaser. It's part of this whole convoluted, illogical IRB process that the state has decided to to use. Even if it was registered with the PRC, there's no guarantee. A lot of times they'll register with the PRC and they'll use fault, not false names, but they'll use the names of attorneys or agents and not even expose the true ownership. So the the question is whether it's a legal entity to purchase the bond. And the second is, is the level of conduct of business justify PRC registration? If you if you wanted to pass this NOI, you can say you can add the additional provision, providing it registers with the PRC, providing it's noted with the PRC. Now, I don't know what the consequences of that might be. There may be some tax issue that would say that we don't want to register as doing business in the state of New Mexico. We're already being taxed in Delaware and that's where we prefer to be. And they would may maybe have to go to the PRC and say what we're doing. Does that rise to the level of doing business in the state of New Mexico? Now, if you want them, if you say that you must be registered, one of the things about registration is, is that if you register with the state with PRC, you are required to have an in-state agent to receive process. If you are not registered with the PRC, you're not required to have an in-state agent to receive process. So it might not be a bad idea to insist that the the bond purchasing LLC file with the PRC merely for the purpose of having an agent within the state to receive process. And I can't see where that would be a stumbling block. So I think we need to do. Do you have in the other IRBs that you've done, Mr. Mr. Duffy, have all the bond purchasers, straw companies that have been set up? Do they all register in New Mexico? 
No. In fact, a fair number of them don't. But what you do get at closing is there is a requirement that the purchaser provide you with its certificate of formation of its incorporation, if it's a corporation bylaws, if it's an LLC, its operating agreement, and resolution signed by the authorized party, you know, verifying that the transaction has been approved by the transaction. So those are usually the documents you'll get from the bond purchaser. And there are representations in the documents that basically tell you that, you know, we're the bond purchaser, we're authorized to do this. And so that's generally what you get. As far as registration, I'd say most don't, but, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't or as a matter of practice, you know, they might not want to go ahead and do that. My concern comes down to the other fact that it's a private sale. So we're avoiding a lot of the SEC requirements that we would go through with other bonds and as well as investors have to have qualifications as well. I'd like to know what your recommendation is, whether that should be an addition to this or if you think it is or could be a deal breaker. I think it's really what the town would be more comfortable with because if you look at a lot of these bond deals across the state and you look at the purchaser, a lot of the purchasers are not qualified to do business. That said, and like Robert said, I think the only question that I'm just not sure of is what the filing fee or the annual franchise tax fee would be on the LLC. I think that's the only real question. If that fee for filing to qualify to do business is something that the company doesn't consider to be too significant and, in fact, it's not, I don't think that should be an issue. But just not knowing the economics and where the company might stand on that. I think that's sort of the, if I were in the company's shoes, that's sort of the main question that I would be concerned about. But I think not knowing that, I think that's the one question I have. Fundamentally, just to add to what Mr. Duffy said, fundamentally, whether it's registered in the state or not, it's really an issue for the developer. There is no liability on the town whether if that company collapses or whatever happens, that's the developer's problem. And the developer is the owner of the LLC. So they're not going to let that happen. This is all these these devices are responsive to a very poorly written state statute, the IRB statute. And so you have to go through this transferring title and lease back and setting up a straw company that's actually within the company, within the developer in order to buy the bond, in order to create this satisfaction of New Mexico statutes. And and as Mr. Duffy said, this is standard practice. Now, how does how could the town be hurt if the bond issuer, if the bond purchaser was a Delaware corporation or a New Mexico corporation? If it's an entity, it has the same contractual powers and nothing that and it doesn't make the company any less of a viable entity by not being registered in the state of New Mexico. And also the town in the IRB, it's specifically mentioned that we have no rights under any of these agreements. We are assigning our rights under these agreements to the developer and to the bond purchaser. We're just a conduit for this whole transaction. So nothing that happens within those parties will affect us. We're hold if it ends up costing them more money, if it ends up changing something in the in their their operation. It doesn't affect us either price wise or liability wise. And I would. And since I'm not a bond counsel, I'm surmising this to be true. And I would ask Mr. Duffy to correct me if I'm wrong in anything I've said tonight. You do assign your rights as to the payments under the bonds to the bond purchaser. So that becomes as between the developer and the bond purchaser. There are certain obligations that the developer has to the town, you know, to maintain the project as a project, 
to, you know, abide by certain covenants in the agreement. And so those rights you don't assign. They do have those covenants to you, and they do have to abide by them. But as to the rights for the payment of the bonds, those are assigned to the bond purchaser. In that case, you're correct. But one thing I'd be happy, since we don't have the developer here, you just don't know what that cost might be, but I'd be happy to recommend to the developer to qualify to do business in New Mexico and see if it's not too much of an issue if they can do it. I think it would advise the town some comfort. I'm happy to do that. I think, since I brought it up, we should at least have an answer from the developer, yes or no, whether they're willing or not, and if not, why. And secondly, the way the partnership is going to work is they're going to deposit $4 million into a bank account at Bank of Albuquerque, and that's pretty much the end of their transaction except for receiving repayment, correct? It's going to be a little different, but somewhat like that. Whenever the developer requires money, it will make a request to the bond depository. That money will then be funded by the bond purchaser, and it's usually on an as-per-draw basis, so he won't fund $4 million at closing. As the project is being constructed, the developer will make requests, so he'll draw on those funds. Once the project is completed, the developer will then start making payments of interest, and there's a principal on the final date. But the bond purchaser essentially doesn't finance after the draws are done being made. So they sort of, at that point, they're just getting the monies from the developer that are paid under the lease as rent payments, which match up with the payments of principal and interest under the bonds. Thank you. Any other questions? Counselor Morris? I believe you've actually answered these questions with your presentation, but just for clarification, the NRG is repaying these bonds. This is not an obligation for the town. Correct. That being said, if NRB defaults on their payments to these bonds, is there any recourse to the town? No. The IRB Act and the documents provide the only asset the developer can go under are the rent payments that are received from the developer. So the town's credit, any of the town's assets outside of that rent payment can't be used to satisfy IRB payments by statute. Just a basic comment just from being a tax preparer. If I'm not mistaken, these IRBs, the reason why that this is actually in place, the state has put this in place, is to allow these type of projects to be done so that people, financers like this SPP company, these financers can receive interest just like any other municipal bond interest and not pay income taxes. So there's a tax advantage for these financers to finance projects like this, which then allows companies like NRG to get the funding to see this through. Now, that being said, this being tax-exempt income, this interest being tax-exempt income, this would not hurt the company in my eyes for registering in New Mexico because it would also be not only tax-exempt to federal, but it's also tax-exempt to New Mexico. So I don't see any problems in asking them to consider registering with the state of New Mexico, giving us a registered agent that we can issue papers to if need be. I think that that's a wise decision, and there's really no tax consequences to them other than a $50 filing fee. And actually, as an LLC, there's not even any annual filing fees. So I think they're in good shape. Mr. Chairman? What I would suggest then in passing the NOI, if you want to amend it, is after the reference to the bond purchaser title, which I'm not sure what the name is, SP, the bond purchaser title, adding the words, which shall be a registered, which shall be registered in the state of New Mexico. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
just so we don't make a mistake in doing that, and I don't think it is a substantial change in the intent of the document that would cause us to not be able to take action in the future. I think we can take that and find the, the most appropriate places. We've got plenty of time to do that. As well as, let's just, let's ask them. I mean, I fully respect Councilor Moronis and it's his profession, but just, I mean, if we're going to get in partnership with them, we ought, probably ought to be friendly with them. And let's, let's ask them the question. Let's make sure that wherever we insert it is the appropriate place and we don't leave out any places that it absolutely needs to be. And I mean, this is just the NOI. And I, I really don't think that that is a significant change to the document that we couldn't do later. Clarification. These bonds will be taxable on the federal level. On the state, they'll be tax exempt. But in order to qualify for tax exempt bonds on a federal level, there's sort of specific requirements and, and, and components your deal has to have. And they're very technical. And in this case, the primary uh, thrust of the deal is really to get the state property tax exemption, but the, the interest on these bonds will be taxable on the federal level. And I, I can tell you, somebody can give me the timeline on how long this has gone on, but the last action that the council just took and this one, this is greater than a year of work and tons and tons of hours of work between Nick Cicillo, Mike Sauber sitting back there in the Office of Sustainability, Peter Russell, Mr. Scavron, Mr. Brown, all the attorneys involved. We have had discussions from several municipalities around the state, um, Deming being one, and they're all kind of sitting back watching to see what we do. And they want to see what template we produce for them to use. So one is I commend all of you for finally getting us to this point. And being that we're, we're pretty well trading on new territory in the state that, that others recognize that we should be watched is, is commendable to, to the team that, that got us there. And especially, um, I want to commend Mr. Scavron because I know the actual security on these was a very contentious debate. And what Councilor Moronis referred to in his first comments was was a pretty contentious issue at, at some points. And I think you fought a good fight and had a great argument and you protected the town overall and limited the risk that the town takes. And some of those issues are are really tough. And I've gotten not quite blow by blow accounts throughout the, the months, but I know the work that's gone on and I, I do appreciate it. Any other discussion? Discussion? Is there a motion? Mr. Mayor. Councilor. I move for approval of Notice of Intent Ordinance Number 1195, an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of the Town of Silver City, New Mexico Industrial Revenue Bond, NRG Solar Silver City LLC Project Series 2012, in the maximum amount of $4 million to provide funds to finance the acquisition, construction, and equipping of a solar power facility for the purpose of generating electricity, authorizing the ex execution and delivery of an indenture, a lease agreement, a bond purchase agreement, bond, and other documents in connection with the issuance of the bond and the project, making certain determinations and findings relating to the bond and the project, ratifying certain actions taken previously, and repealing all actions inconsistent with this ordinance. There's some corrections to the document, um, some amendments that we have to make. Is that not correct? Yeah, I'm going to enter that into my. We can make them. The 15 miles. We can make them on the tail end. We can make them on the tail end. Okay. It's just it's it's stating the statute. Okay, so that doesn't need to be done in the motion. Then. 
and we'll we'll make sure that those get inserted in the, okay. the absolute correct places. Is there a second? Yes. The second. The motion is stated. Motion second. There's a motion and a second to approve notice of intent, ordinance number 1195, as read and presented on the agenda and, and noticed. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of resolution number 2012-07, a resolution supporting an application for New Mexico Main Street Capital Outlay Fund Grant Award. Councilor Moronis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're looking at a, a resolution in support of a grant application by uh, the Silver City Main Street uh, Project um, looking to uh, apply for a grant for, uh, to help purchase the, the Silco Theater. This is the second time we've come to, uh, to council for a resolution. Uh, the first one passed. Unfortunately, the grant didn't go through. Uh, one key difference between this one and the original is the original uh, grant application, we didn't have any matching funds. This one does. It makes a, a, a very material difference there. Um, but it was also one of the reasons why the first grant did not get awarded. Uh, it went. Uh, the grant was awarded to a New Mexico Main Street community that actually had an application with matching funds. Um, in my support for this uh, this resolution uh, supporting the application for, for a grant, um, I'd like to just briefly talk about a little bit about the Main Street and its relationship with the town and, and a little bit of its history. Uh, the Silver City Main Street project has, has been in existence for 27 years, the uh, longest lasting uh, Main Street community uh, in the state of New Mexico. Um, it's it, it's accredited under the uh, National Trust and the State Main Street Project, which is under the Economic Development, um, the, the Economic Department of the State of New Mexico. Um, in that mandate, there is very specific uh, requirements that, that Main Street has a, a very strong relationship and partnership with the Town of Silver City. In this relationship, uh, the Town of Silver City, over over the 27 years, has has provided. Uh, number of funding and, and professional service contracts upwards of a, of a few hundred thousand dollars over those that time. Um, in, in return, uh, Main Street has leveraged that into millions of dollars of, of infrastructure, including uh, the first building that, that it's pr provided for uh, Silver City. This, this would not be the first building that uh, um, the town would be receiving from the Silver City Main Street project, the first one being the visitor center. Uh, other other projects uh, that have added up and added the, the return into the millions is the Big Ditch Park, uh, the downtown sidewalk projects, the downtown uh, street projects. Uh, Main Street's been very successful in, in bringing in uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars to the community. And, and as such, they, they're always looking to perform under their professional service contracts, uh, trying to figure out how to better the downtown, make it more vibrant. Uh, this is one of the uh, areas that it has uh, uh, found to, to be very beneficial to the, to the community. On very specific issues that I would like to uh, present uh, articulating this, the importance of the Silco project. One is there's a tremendous cultural benefit. Uh, this, uh, this aids the performance arts community of and, and the community at large. As, as a performance arts uh, venue, as a stage theater, this is uh, very similar to funding museums by towns. This is very similar to funding libraries to towns. They're, they're very culturally sensitive and, and very culturally important to towns. Many towns do have uh, performance arts venues, and I bet you, well, I would venture a guess, but I have no hard facts that many of them would love to get one like that at the, at the match that, that's being suggested here. On another el, uh, element, and this is very important to Main Street projects as well, is historical preservation of their downtown. Uh, this is a 1920s building, one of the first, if not the first, uh, theater in the downtown area. This, as a historical preservation project, this rivals many others. In fact, uh, 
we the town owns uh, other historical buildings like the waterworks building which i cannot imagine being uh, in as good a condition or being as productive for this price that, that we're looking at right here um, extremely important for downtown and we we would love to uh, uh, preserve the the intent of this building as a theater as opposed to uh, what it could be done in, in uh, by various um, uh, commercial interests such as the Silco Mini Mall uh, furniture store. You know that that didn't really meet the intent of this historical building. Um, on a on a on another uh, benefit is the economic benefit. The the major benefit here is traffic. This ha this theater has generated a tremendous amount of traffic over the last six years. The last statistic I saw was something in the neighborhood of 14,000 people have come in through this uh, uh, through this theater. Incidentally, this traffic has materialized during one of the greatest recessions this country uh, has has seen. Uh, in fact, oftentimes called the Great Recession. I would say, in large part, bringing in that traffic. Um, as a cornerstone venue of the southern part of, of Bullard has, in many cases, kept doors open downtown uh, by our restaurants, uh, bars, by many of our venues. This, this has kept gross receipts coming into our community like no other venue. Um, as, a, as a project by Silco, you know, as a project by the Silver City Main Street project, six years ago, um, in part of its strategic planning, this this was the downtown action plan by the Silver City Main Street. Silver City Main Street, uh, half a dozen years ago, was noticing that there was a, a huge decrease in traffic on the south part of Bullard, where the north part of Bullard was getting a lot of um, new new venues, new renovations, new businesses, a lot of new activity, and there was a lot of activity dying on the southern part of Bullard. So they knew that they specifically needed to get some sort of a cornerstone venue to bring in traffic. And I would say it's been illustrated as a, as a tremendous success in that regard. Um, there's, there's questions in this that, that I've heard about uh, cost. And I would say the cost would be greatly mitigated by the, uh, the agreement and, and uh, by the Main Street Project to continue its lease payment that it's been currently doing. Uh, its current lease payments would probably be paying every dollar back to the town within 10 years. Um, but I would speculate at the, uh, with the history of Main Street, if they were to get this, this award and actually be able to execute this, they would probably be getting more grants to be uh, paying the town back and renovating this building fully um, well within that 10-year period. Um, it is my understanding that, that the and this would this can come with clarification from uh, the Main Street manager uh, Nick is um, Main Street fully intends to see this through they intend to to uh, pay a lease on this to operate it to keep traffic coming downtown to to keep up the good work and and make sure that even during recessions that that we have traffic uh, generated and and feeding our downtown businesses that that produce um, a couple hundred thousand dollars in gross receipts tax to the town each and every year. It's just uh, of, uh, of vital importance to, to downtown. You know, I, I mentioned that this was, this is pretty much Main Street's downtown action plan uh, of half a dozen years ago. We, we've had a, a downtown action plan uh, revisited and, and redone in, in the last few years for the community as a whole. And I would say that it's uh, built upon the good work of this uh, Silco Theater because with the work that it's done it's diverted attention to other areas that, that, that need to be serviced. If that Silco wasn't there, the downtown action plan I would see being very different and probably focused on doing something very similar to this. Um, it, is, it is extremely important to, to seeing the downtown action plan in its entirety uh, materialize. Um, that being said, um, I would I would love to have uh, uh, Nick do a presentation uh, for for Main Street. It's been a long night for you all.
you all, so I'll try to make this as quick as I can. Uh, my name is Nick Seibel. I'm the Silver City Main Street Project Manager, known for my skill in brief presentations. And uh, tonight you have a resolution of support in front of you for um, this grant that I hold in my hand, all 107 pages of it, um, to the New Mexico Main Street Capital Outlay Fund. The legislature in its special session last fall appropriated $1 million to New Mexico Main Street for capital outlay projects with an emphasis on projects that will create jobs in communities throughout the state. And we're very excited about this project. Um, I think Councilor Moronis did an excellent job in laying out some of the history, some of our, our justifications for doing this in Silver City and why we think it's important to this community. Um, we feel we have a very good shot at getting these funds. We are applying for $200,000, which is the maximum amount that they'll be awarding. Um, but the difference between this and past um, efforts to secure funding for the SOCO is the match that the town has generously um, agreed to provide in exchange for the obvious benefits to the town. Um, also, just a history of planning documents from our town's um, cultural district plan to the downtown action plan, which came up with the idea of the theater district, to the theater district plan that was uh, written with the assistance of the State Economic Development Department in Mexico Main Street. Um, the purchase of the Silco Theater is also listed on the town's infrastructure and capital improvements plan, and that also will garner us additional points in the grant scoring process. So really, we feel like we're exceptionally well placed to bring these funds home to Silver City, and I appreciate your support of this resolution tonight. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Questions? Let me go to the audience first. Any questions from the audience? Seeing none, any comments, questions from the council? Councilor Bettison. I guess I'm calling up now, not the questions, really. Um, I, I appreciate the passion um, and commitment that Councilor Moronis and, and you yourself, Nick, have brought to this. Um, I think most people know that I work in historic building and have for the past 21 years, and I have a passion for them. But I also know how much they cost to run, how much the cost is to renovate. Um, and I know how the one that I work in is basically, you know, crumbling in some senses. And, you know, um, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Just, you know, it's it's actually older than this building. It was built in 1916, 1917. So um, it, I think my concern is this. Um, I question the feasibility of the town acquiring another property that's historic. Um, you know, we, we, you know, own several historic buildings already, namely the current um, town uh, museum the waterworks building, town hall. I mean, I can't remember all of them, but, you know, these are some of them at least. I think, uh, and a few other buildings as well. Um, I, I guess uh, I feel a little bit better about the fact that there's a possibility of the town not necessarily having to pay the full freight. Um, but with that, I'm concerned about some of the wording in here where we have um, to, the resolution, to me, at least on the face of reading it, completely binds us. When, when the, if the council passes this, we've bound ourselves to come um, to providing $169,000 in matching funds to complete the acquisition of the Circle Theater should the grant funding be awarded. Doesn't mean that just 200000 it could be any any portion thereof, it doesn't say that it has to be 200000 although 200000 is listed in there. So um, I, I would really like to see us change the wording a little bit, just something that we've done in some other grant funds, which is pretty typical of what we do. We always include the line subject to available funds. And it's a very typical thing that the town uses in grant funding. I don't think it's going to necessarily um, affect this, but it's a Typical wording that the I've seen, and I've always encouraged that we use in other in other um, resolutions for grants. So um, there is a location to place that, but 
I don't know if the town manager or council has any. Do you want to tell us what it is? What? Subject to available funds. That's what I said. That's the typical wording. Placed after um, further commits to, in the now therefore be it resolved section, where it says, and further commits to provide $169,000 in matching funding, you add the words subject to available funds. That's typically those four words, subject to available funds, is usually inserted in there. Mr. Mayor, if I might address that concern. I should point out that the request for proposals for this grant was exceedingly specific in requiring us to commit this match for this grant. And absent that commitment, we will not qualify for the $200,000 that we are seeking. Uh, Madam Council, that can be required in the grant application, but even in the state constitution, it specifically says as long as funds are available. And the council has the authority to budget or not to budget the funds if they're not if they are or are not available. And this is even something that the state itself does. But they want to, it's, it's a play on words to bully you from the state level into, you're going to do it no matter what. But under, state, under the state constitution, if you choose not to budget the funds or cannot budget the funds, uh, through a budget adjustment this current year or bud put it in the budget for next fiscal year, they can't force you to. If, might I ask? We haven't removed the word commit. We've added four words. So the word commit, if that's what they're looking for, is still in there. And it just adds the four words that's already in the state constitution and that's something that we have a tendency to use in almost every single a resolution for grant funding. So, I mean, I, I understand the concern, but I have a concern on the other side that I, I really, I, as, as over the, this is my third year on the council, so it's part, it's in the middle of my second term. I think many people know I always have issues with being pushed into a corner, especially when it comes to the town's money. I am much more careful with other people's money than I am with my own. So when it comes to saying that we are going to do something, I always want to make sure, wherever down the line there is, that there's a potential for and out. And I know that there is, um, there's other mechanisms for that because even if awarded, we still have to agree to the, to the grant. To the grant. That's correct. And I would, I would point out, if I might, that there, you do have protections under state law and, and your own rules here. I would, I would hate to see us weaken our case for this funding because this is an extremely competitive grant process that I think we're very well placed for currently. And I, I'd hate to see us diminish our chances for bringing these funds home based on in, including a few words for something that we all intend on doing we just know that the possibility might exist that we might not be able to. I, I would say that it... Any municipal or governmental entity in the state of New Mexico can say commit, but under the state constitution, they don't have the right to, to commit unless the governmental entity has the funds available. So whether you, you leave just commit in there or add these words, you're saying they, it's the exact same thing. My concern is this. Is I understand completely without saying. I also understand what you're saying. But for all of the residents that are out there, they may not understand that distinction. They're seeing it as we have fully committed to use these funds. And for other folks are going to come back and say, if something happens and the funds aren't available, they're going to say, but you signed a resolution. 
You agreed to a resolution. What do you mean you don't have the money? I mean, we've heard this time and time again that the town is committed to do something and we've pulled out and we haven't done what we said we were going to do. So I guess that's where I have concerns with the wording is I want to make it perfectly clear that that, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I just I just think that there's 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 this general sense out there that people think that we've signed everything away and that then when something happens, we can't do it. Then they go, why didn't you do it for those people that want it to be done? I hope hopefully you understand my point of view on this. Well, I, I, I certainly do understand your point of view and having having been on the other side of this, I, I understand the hesitation to make a commitment that could be misconstrued. So. Uh, yes. Robert, that's probably better language. Uh, it, it probably would be um, commit to the extent legally permissible by. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be better. And no. Really? That's fine. Okay. So then, then, and then we're not making it sound like we don't have the money. It's saying. We're just following the state constitution. We're also arguing if the red apple is red. Right. That's true. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a moot point. I mean, for one, I just say that the record of this meeting is, I almost said a bad word, is the, the fallback to what your argument is, that those issues were discussed. But I, I still have to go back to nobody's asked the obvious question of do we have the funds available well, and why and where? There's another question besides that. Well, I'm, I'm going to get there. That was the next or, or you'll get there. But can we, ask, can we answer the basic question there first? As of today, no. As of today, no. We don't no have $165,000 available. $169,000 okay. $169, available to to commit now. Okay. But yeah. as we see, things change every day, and beginning of the fiscal year, the end of the fiscal year, it depends on how revenues come in, how projects are, are if we have to increase uh, funding for current projects. The town in the last two years has done more projects than most communities in half of the state of New Mexico. And it's it's just, I can't say we have $169,000 sitting in the bank waiting for this project. No. Hmm. However, the gross receipts projections that we're looking at right now show that we will. Yes. If we so choose at that time to do a budget adjustment and do that. Yes. We're, we're on pace to, to, to be approximately over $600,000 over projected revenues. That was going to be my next question, but, you know, not at the moment. I reserve the right to come back and ask a question, though. I'm just saying. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to address one other point that Councillor Benison made. And I certainly understand the hesitation about acquiring a historic property. I know they're not always all they cracked up to be. I'm working with a private property owner right now that's working on rehabilitating a building just across the street. And I hear on an almost daily basis about the new adventures that they've had that day in terms of finding out what they're doing. It is our hope, and this, this is from the Main Street side of things, the first step in a larger process to be able to handle the redevelopment of this and other theater properties downtown by the private sector, not by the town. And what we envision is a public-private partnership where the town will have a role in, 
but the long-term maintenance of these buildings and the actual renovations, if we choose to go ahead with this plan, would not be the responsibility of the town government. They would be the responsibility of the private sector. And in the interim, until, if and until we decide to move ahead with such a plan, Main Street's been operating this theater for the last six years. And it's Main Street's intention to continue operating this, as Councilor Marone has pointed out, and paying rent to the town, essentially, for what this is going to cost us. So you're looking at a potential um, public amenity for citizens and visitors to the town of Silver City. And you're talking about, essentially, no net cost to the town for, for getting it. So I, I thought I should point that out as well. What is the purchase price of the property, and is there any guarantee that the purchase price closing all costs would be within the $369,000 if allocated? The purchase price, we have a purchase agreement um, with the current property owners um, that actually expires at the end of June currently, and uh, the purchase price specified in there is $369,000. That does not include closing costs for the property. And who covers the closing? Well, when the contract was negotiated, and it was negotiated by Main Street, the purchaser was to cover the closing costs. And this grant agreement anticipates the transfer of that agreement to the town. And so, I mean, that's, that's to be determined. But I think there are a few things that we could look at that could help get us there. Okay. Um, please. Please. There was some discussion of $35,000 worth of improvements that Main Street has already put into the property. Will that go towards the purchase price? Is that a credit to the 369000 or is that something separate? That's what I just alluded to in terms of funds that we could potentially look to in terms of covering some of those closing costs. So, But that's a conversation that we've yet to have. So. And I don't want to make any representations about how that will go one way or the other right now because we haven't really discussed that yet. But it's certainly an issue out there that remains to be resolved. Thank you. I'll tell you, I have, there's a couple of concerns. One is how old is the appraisal? It has to be within six months. December of last year. So we're going to have to do another appraisal. And... Your contract expires June, and Alex just stated that the 169,000 would not be available till July 1 at the earliest. That's correct. So we have some issues that we need to get worked out as far as what the sale price could be and how far we've pushed the owner. Right. I, if we have commitments. We receive this grant funding, and the town commits tonight to the match. I think we would have a very good case to make to the property owner for a short extension of that contract. And given that this has been a process that's gone on six years now, I think if there was not just light at the end of the tunnel, but you could see the mouth of the tunnel clearly, I think that uh, we could probably make that happen. Do you know what the last appraisal was? I do. It appraised at $10,000 more than the purchase price, $379,000. Councilor Bettison. I just want to say, you know, you just said something that I was afraid of. If the town commits tonight to the $169,000 match, what we said is we can't, we are committing to the extent that we are legally, but we're not committing. Of all of this. I mean, right, but, I, but but you just said something right. that I had mentioned that I was concerned about. Main Street is committed in this purchase agreement to close the purchase of the agreement on, on June 29th, which we have every intention of trying to make happen, but things can happen that would prevent that happening. And in these situations, I would hope it's understood that that can, that can happen. Right, and I, I think that's what I was trying to say, right. is that the same thing can happen on the town side exactly. as well. As far as the extension, um, there, there is something that, that um, our preliminary budget has to be approved May 31st, um, which is 
a month before the end of the contract period. So that does give Main Street, because we would have to put that 160, if we're going to actually do it next fiscal year, we would put it in that preliminary budget. That would give Main Street a month to go to to the current owner and say, look, we've al they've already approved it in the current budget for next fiscal year. Give us, please give us some time into the next fiscal year, and then the, the contract can go forward. Mr. Mayor, I'll point out that's as close to a commitment as you can get before you have a check in your hand, I think, pretty much. So. I, I agree. I, I think the proper wording would have been a strong appearance of commitment. Would have, would have kept a counselor off your back. But, <laughs> you know. If the council felt it necessary to amend the wording of the resolution beyond that recommended in the RFP, I think that Councillor Scavern's suggested wording would probably accomplish what I'm hearing from the council while not impeding us in our efforts to successfully bring home $200,000 that we don't otherwise get. I'm not sure exactly what the new wording is that he is recommending. The suggestion would be after and further commits, comma, to the extent legally permissible, comma, and then continuing on to provide 169,000 in matching funds. Okay. Thank you. Are you satisfied? Yes. You just guess we call them unexpected. We can we can make that as an amendment after there's a motion. Any other questions from the council? I Nick, I, we've had a lot of talks about this, and I actually sat in the meeting in Santa Fe with you where this, where all the guidelines for this grant got laid out. And I also got a great feeling for the competitiveness, did I spit that out right, of this grant fund that's available statewide. I can honestly tell you all the whereases. I fully, fully support the apprehensions that I continue to have and that make you nervous every time you hear me talk about this is because we're still somewhat dependent on a vision. And we've all seen plans and plans and there's, I, I think we've got plans to plan. They don't always come true. I've looked at the books for the theater for the last two, three years. There's some hiccups in there. It would have been much easier for me to really have some aggressive excitement had the books been a little bit cleaner, had, and I'm not going to talking about the accounting side of it, it's, it's actually the balances. <laughs> And showing that this was a direct revenue producer that could self-support. I think with the theater plan, there is a, a wonderful vision. I think you've also explained to me on a few occasions that of all of the plans downtown, this may not be the best place to start. But we're kind of confronted with the conditions of today that put us here and, and put this at the, on the table. I don't, I just don't know and I don't have the confidence that the the building can generate the revenue and and I'm, I'm really talking primary re revenue. I, I think secondary revenue is, I mean if it generates the primary it's going to generate significant secondary revenue and the, and the restaurants will will be very happy and more may pop up. I haven't seen the plan that shows me that that's really, really going to happen. 
and you know when you people see that the town is going to buy a venue there's some feelings or belief that well it's a public property it's a public building and it's a venue for for whatever purpose that the cost will be very very cheap and and or they can pretty much make a reservation and go use it and pay a cleaning fee and it, and that's that really cannot be the business model for this or we're all going to be in trouble and you're going to look for a job so and I should point out that absent a decision by the town which for the period of time the town owns it it's certainly within the rights of the town to say okay we're going to subsidize this and anyone can go use it that's not my intention in asking for your support and I don't think it's anyone's intention that that's the direction we're going to go but there is the Soko Theater as it operates today is competitive with other rental venues in the community and I should point out that it's competitive with other publicly owned rental venues and I'm referring specifically to the County Business and Conference Center um, I don't think that it's unprecedented that this should work. It, it depends on the terms and the periods. The, the way they structure their rental agreements are different from the way that we structure ours. But depending on the terms and times and that sorts of things, I think they're very comparable. So I'll, I'll point that out as well. I, I just think it's important for full disclosure that people not be guided to think that there's going to be basically free access to another building. Comments? Comments? Councilor Morales. Mr. Mayor, um, very good discussion. Um, I'm still fully in, in support of this uh, uh, this resolution for the following reasons. Um, we will not find a cultural benefit for less than $170,000. We will not find a historical preservation uh, benefit for less than $170,000. And we will not find an economic benefit for less than 170,000 of the benefit that's going to be generated through this. Um, in fact, uh, for $170,000, the benefits are unprecedented on almost anything I've seen in the last couple of years, um, especially in light of what some of the projects we've done of recent. And as such, I'd like to, uh, well, not like, I will make a motion for approval of resolution number 2012-07, a resolution supporting an application for New Mexico Main Street Capital Outlay, Outlay Fund grant award with the um, following correction on the now therefore be it resolved um, that the town of Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico fully supports this application and further commits, comma, to the extent legally permissible comma to provide 169,000 in matching funding to complete the acquisition of the Silco Theater should the grant funding be awarded. Mr. Mayor, I second the motion to state it. There's a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2012-07 as amended. Is there any other discussion? There's a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2012-07 a resolution supporting an application for New Mexico Main Street Capital Outlay fund grant award as amended with the now therefore be it resolved to read that the town of Silver City of Grant County, New Mexico fully supports this application and further commits, comma, to the extent legally permissible, comma, to provide $169,000 in matching funding to complete the acquisition of the Soco Theater should the grant funding be awarded. Roll call, please. Councilor Moronis? Aye. Councilor Ray? Aye. Councilor Thompson? Aye. Councilor Bettison? Aye. Motion carries. Thanks, Nick. This is not the ending of something, but rather the beginning of something even better for our town, and I really thank you all for your support here tonight. Next item on the agenda is approval, disapproval of request for proposal number 1112-1P, general engineering support. Mr. Brown. No, Council, the town received five proposals for general engineering services for RFP. 11 slash 12 dash 1 P general general engineering services support services its staff's recommendation to uh, enter into negotiations uh, 
with uh, Engineers Inc. and Smith Engineering for these services. Any discussion? Yes, Councilor. I move that we approve request for proposal um, 11 slash 12 dash 1P general engineering support per staff's recommendation. Councilor. I second that motion is made. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Um, Councilor. These are the two uh, firms that we currently use right now, right? As yes, yes, um, the one thing that I, we had four evaluators, um, I, I do want to say that um, one of our department heads um, is the brother of, of, of the partner of one of the firms that we're recommending, and he was not part of the evaluation committee. Uh, we had uh, representatives of uh, some of the departments that actually worked with the firms and we had actually an engineer as part of the evaluation committee that did not bid on the project. Have they always provided their services as agreed? Yeah. Yeah. To your, had very good, to your satisfaction? Uh, uh, actually, we use them in different for um, different types of projects because uh, Smith Engineering has uh, we've used them primarily for um, uh, the landfill services, getting the old landfill and those types of things, uh, because uh, they've got uh, some expertise there and a very good relationship uh, with the Environment Department, South Waste Bureau, um, which has um, actually allowed us to proceed with all of the construction on the old landfill right now and um, Engineers Inc. has done work for us for many years on streets, drainage, those types of things. Um, we do look uh, th that propose that for large projects in the future that um, we do go out for bid for engineering services um, and these would be for more minor projects that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a motion and a second. Do you know something? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that I appreciated the notes that were provided from the evaluation committee about the reasons for uh, why um, these these two um, companies were selected. It really explained the scoring that was done. I mean, how the scores came out. Um, pretty much what you just uh, discussed with Councilor Moranis and explained. And, and there are other projects that, you know, as, as the mayor explained, uh, we're looking at the regional water um, project and the town is the fiscal agent for the regional water project and uh, we most likely would be going out to bid for it and applying it for the Grant County Water Commission and that would be one of those projects that we would put out to RFP because it would be a large project. Any other discussion? There's a motion and a second to approve staff recommendation on RFP 10 slash 11 dash 1P general engineering support to enter into negotiations with Engineers Inc. and Smith Engineering. All those in favor signify by saying what? Isn't there 11 slash 12P on the, on, the, uh, on the agenda it's 11 slash 12P. Yeah, 12. it is. It's, there's a typo. Yeah. It's 11 slash 12 dash 1P. My apologies. There's a typo on the on the the actual bottom part. So let's start this again. There's a motion second to approve staff recommendation to enter into negotiations for engineering services for RFP 10 slash 12 dash 1P general engineering support to Engineers Inc. and Smith Engineering. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Or we can stay here all night. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I'll second it. There is a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>